Before we get into the following interview, just a note to let you know what's in the pipeline here at Inside Myanmar Podcast. Up until now, all of our work has been conventional sit-down interviews with a single person discussing their background and perspective, like the one that follows. As great as this format is, we're experimenting with new dynamics as we adapt to better respond to the current crisis. We are now working on an upcoming series examining the spread of the coronavirus in Myanmar, especially its impact on monasteries and monastics, as well as how meditators are faring around the world. We have also begun a feature called Myanmar Dhamma Diaries, in which a single story will be told and then examined for its relevance in understanding Buddhist life in the Golden Land. But for now, enjoy what's next, as we know this is a very special interview that follows. Sui Win and I bonded over a decade ago with a shared personal commitment to Vipassana meditation and a professional interest in community development. From the time I first met him and began to hear about his background, I felt privileged as an exclusive audience of one, but hoped that a wider audience would someday be able to hear his amazing story, which combines an inner journey towards liberation with an outer engagement in political and humanitarian affairs. Several times while in the company of fellow meditators, I would try to tell some of his story, but my secondhand accounts could never do them justice. So I'm very happy that we have this emerging podcast platform that allows Sway Win to tell his inspiring story in his own words, animated by his intensity and the power of his memories. I actually hadn't seen Sway Win in several years, and when I called him out of the blue and mentioned the Insight Myanmar podcast I was starting up, I hoped he might vaguely consider being a guest at some point in the future. Instead, he surprised me by being willing to come in just two days' time, which was especially amazing to me considering how much else I knew he was currently balancing in his life. He arrived slightly earlier than expected and explained that as his daughter was asleep in the car on an unusually cool January evening, he had just 45 minutes to talk. I said that would be up to the length of his answers and he laughed and promised to be succinct. But fortunately for listeners, he did not limit himself to short perfunctory answers. In the end, he treated us all to a fuller accounting of his compelling story than I initially hoped for. There's certainly a lot of food for thought in this interview. A dedicated Vipassana meditator from the SN Goenka tradition, and not afraid to use his voice where he sees injustice. Sway Win's journey for inner peace has coincided with the outer turmoil he has lived through in this country's recent history. Intensive meditation retreats are no easy matter, wherever in the world one may be. But to undertake that spiritual journey when stability and even basic freedoms are not ensured adds a lot of weight and immediacy to the contemplation of Anicca and Dukkha. Our interview was interrupted by his daughter, who had awoken and somehow found her way into the recording studio. So we wrapped up, and I wished them well, thanking them again for their generous time. But as we didn't reach the more recent events in Sway Win's life during our conversation, I'd like to take a moment to share that here. Sway Win is currently the editor-in-chief at Myanmar Now, and the youngest recipient of the Ramon Magsaysay Award for Emergent Leadership. He has led investigative reporting into such issues as human rights abuses, corruption, including the family wealth of military generals, and more. His report into a child abuse scandal at a Yangon tailor shop resulted in the resignation of four members of the Myanmar National Human Rights Commission and disciplinary actions against police officers in Jaukteda Township. Sui Win has also been a fierce critic of the ultra-nationalist monk, Ashin Wiratu, and felt that the monastic's fiery speeches went so far against the Buddhist teachings that it merited defrocking. This criticism ultimately resulted in a defamation lawsuit in which he was required to take more than 50 trips from his Yangon home to the Mandalay courtroom, a 36-hour round trip by car. 
and with a threat hanging over his head that missing even a single session would result in him immediately being reprimanded and thrown into jail. Sui Win later said that this experience, quote, has instilled a sense of fear in all newsrooms for covering the Buddhist monks and the nationalist movement, end quote, that this kind of harassment awaits any journalist who honestly covers these events. As you can now probably better imagine, there's quite a bit packed into this interview, and it's a privilege and an honor to be able to bring this story to you. Clear your schedule, because this one requires your complete attention. So Sui Win, it's really great to have you here. Thanks so much for joining us on short notice. I'm trying to remember the last time we saw each other. I think it was a few years ago. It's definitely been longer than, than I would have liked, but we, we've been busy. And of course, it's been a number of years since we knew each other um, back at the American Center, uh, where we used to spend some time. Mm-hmm. I remember the first time we met, I, um, I think it was at a, a party or a get together for something of your students that I was attending that, from a colleague that was taking care of you. Then you came up to me and you said, didn't you go to a group sitting at Dhamma Jyoti at, uh, you know, SN Glenka Center? I said, yeah, you were there too. And apparently you had seen me from there. So we shared that connection. Sure. Because uh, a decade ago, those were the days, my meditation was very intense. <laughs> so I was always trying to find like-minded individuals uh, to strengthen myself, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why when somebody said, uh, uh, American teacher at the American Center uh, is also a meditator at the Goenka, 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 uh, uh, Goenka Center, I was intrigued. I wanted to say hello. Yes. <laughs> but I wanted to make sure <laughs> <laughs> whether the information uh, I was given was accurate or not. <laughs> <laughs> it was accurate. Yeah, I, I remember I was so happy too because I was, um, I, I, at my time, my early time at the American Center, I, uh, I hadn't met many people that were in both worlds. And so um, it, it was really quite nice to, to learn that we were sharing the same things at the American Center, but we were also doing the same practice. And that was, that was really a different world back then. Yeah, I have two memorable uh, things uh, uh, with you, mm. uh, you took me uh, to Siataji's uh, village. That's right. Uh, in 2007, mm. I think uh, in the immediate aftermath of 2007, Saffron Revolution. Uh. Uh, so uh, the road was a ma- stay muddy road. Yeah, uh, yeah. Muddy and Bambi road. Yeah. You know, uh, only the motorbikes uh, can assess the uh, Siataji village. Yeah. Uh, there, there was no car at all, actually. You know, it took like well, at least an hour or so, actually. You have a good memory. <laughs> <laughs> and then you took me uh, to one of the houses in the village, you know? Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. Who suppose the visitors, you know? Exactly. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, to the Siataji Center. So we had we a light me, actually, right. uh, at the house. So I, I remember that uh, that was the first incident with you. And then another incident is we went together to uh, uh, to the uh, uh, Yehana Ordination Hall, uh, located uh, at the southern entrance of Shudagong Bagoda. And then I remember you complained about the noises <laughs> coming from the Happy War. And I, I agree. <laughs> That's right. You know, Happy World I, Amusement if, Park. If I became a ruler of this country, yeah. <laughs> I would outlaw, you know, all these, you know, noisy, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. uh, polluted, contaminated, you know, the environment. Right. You know? Happy World uh, Happy yeah. World Amusement Park is yeah. like a very cheap ripoff yeah. of Disney World or something. And yeah. it's right next door yeah. to Shredagon. But that's so funny that you remember going to Siataji's because I'm just amazed that... I mean, Burmese people have done so much in taking me to these sites. So it's just hearing the story. I feel happy that that even though I was only in the country a short time, I actually knew about a Dhamma site. You didn't, and I got to take you there. So that's really cool. Yeah, because, because of that, I managed to bring many others, actually, oh, you know, to see right. that Jesus. Uh, Siataji place. Yeah. Even some foreign yogis as well, actually. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Dhamma surprise. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. uh, like, like, like this, actually. You, you know, yeah. it's funny because some of those sites, especially Pyoboji, they have these guest books that mm-hmm. foreigner, when foreign yogis go, they give for them to sign. Mm-hmm. And one time when I was at Pyoboji, they showed me, you know, Siataji's meditation center, Tazang. 
they showed me these guest book going back, I think like 35 years, just mm -hmm. astounding. So you can see, you know, any Dhamma friend you've ever had who's been here, mm -hmm. you can track their visit and there's, you know, business cards or words of, of gratitude or sometimes pictures. Even Goenkaji's name is in there, Mataji's name is in there, very big names of people who visited have signed it. So one time I went back and I said, you know, I really would like to see all these guest books, just take pictures of every page, you know, have, have preserved this, this, um, um, this, uh, this list of everyone who's been, and they couldn't find them anywhere. So it took us about an hour to go through, you know, all the different mm -hmm. places and shelves in the monastery, and they eventually pulled it out. They pulled out, you know, five books about Yehai and, um, and went through and just looked at these last 35 years. So mm -hmm. that's an interesting record. Yeah. So, um, so that's great. Um, I have a lot to fit in in this time. So let's just start right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mention something a little bit about your, your, your family, where you were brought up, your, your early circumstances. Yeah, currently I'm a journalist, you know, uh, based here in Yango. Uh, I, I was born and bred uh, here in the same town in Yango, uh, uh, in a new neighborhood, you know, in one of the satellites Towns of Yango, so I was born in 1978. So, in, in just a poor normal family, normal family. Uh, but I think I came into contact with the Ma actually uh, since very young age mm. actually. Uh, if I have to, uh, if I have to cite Siaji uh, Goenga's uh, uh, theory actually about the Dhamma, I would say. I brought a Dhamma plan with me. Mm, from uh, the last life. From the last life. Oh, right. So I think I am that kind, that, that kind of person. Mm. But I only uh, knew about that after uh, having practice, you know, yeah. uh, the Vivashana meditation. We'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll get to that. So what was your, what attitude did your family have about religion or Dhamma practice as you were brought up? Yeah. Uh, to, to, to be fair, actually, my parents are good nature, honest, uh, etc., and a generous family. But their honesty, I would say, is just moderate, actually. Mm. Nothing strict, nothing serious, you know, mm. actually. Sometimes they may break, you know, uh, this sila or that sila, the small, uh, small rules, actually. Mm. Particularly regarding the rule. Governing just the oral communication that you had, verbal communication mm. that you early, you know, right speech. Line, right speech, yeah. I would say. So, so that's the right vocabulary, at you early, you know. So, not a very strict uh, Sila family, mm -hmm. I would say, mm. to be fair, mm. to be fair. But to a greater extent, they are very generous, mm. very simple minded family. I think our family. Is the most generous family in the entire neighborhood. Mm. Whenever my father got something, he started thinking about sharing and uh, mm. giving a free party. Actually, mm, free mm. party. Party is not in the, in the sense of the Western party. Actually, mm. you know, cooking something, like a and opening, yeah, your doors to oh, everyone. Actually, right, right. we don't even know invitation. Uh -huh. we, we never have the idea of invitation. Uh -huh. The idea of invitation is very. Uh, very new thing. Uh, it's a Western concept. Yeah. Even the appointment or invitation. Just the doors are open. People yeah. walk in. Yeah. You just invite the mams. Right. Nobody invite at you. It's uh, invited. Uh. It's just a lot. Hey, we have, you know, we are, we are hold this ceremony or that ceremony on this day at you early. We just separate out the word at you early mm. from one person to another. Mm. Everyone is invited. Mm. First come, first serve. Mm. No special arrangement. For any particular person, actually, right. yeah, you know, yeah. my father will greet anyone uh, from the street. He doesn't care, you know, whether the food is left for any elderly person or honorary person coming late. Right. He did, he wouldn't care. He he never care. So that was the kind of an environment yeah. you had growing in, up. Environment. Yeah. Sometimes the abode camp, mm. but some abode Buddhist abode. Right. They the did not Seda. bring themselves with the jam, you know, novices at you were. My father would not tolerate that, you know. My father said, "You must bring everyone ah. <laughs> from the from the monastery. Everyone." Uh, so he uh, really had quite yeah, a bit yeah, of generosity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. everyone. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. was that the this quality of generosity? Was that kind of the main feature yeah. that you saw of the Dhamma practice or the the Buddhist religion coming out growing up? Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
Right. And so then um, as you went through life, I, I was referencing some things about you before the interview and I refreshed my memory that you had uh, a really deep and early desire and love of British literature, that you really got into it. And this was a time in Myanmar, this was before the, you know, the information age came to the rest of the world fairly, not, not so long ago, but the difference between the information age in the West and what came before it in terms of the internet wasn't that great. We had libraries and such. In Myanmar, it's like, you know, the, the last five or 10 years, it felt like 200, you know, we're living with Wi-Fi and internet now. But back then, you could barely buy books. You had to rent books or you had to, to borrow them. You had very little access to it. Um, so how, how did you get a hold of those books at an early age? I think... Uh, it very much it's very much concerned uh, with the conditions uh, we grew up in. Mm. So this is an isolated society. Yeah. Uh, the level of the poverty, the level of the governance actually. So you have so many things in command. Mm. You know, with the events which happened in the Western War, like 200 years ago, mm. 300 years ago. Right, so like 15 years ago yeah. felt like two or 300 yeah. years ago here. Yeah. So sometimes you cannot express, you know, what you've been going through. Hmm. But you find them, you know, hmm. you find these expressions in this old literature. Ah, interesting. Uh, so, hmm. for example, I always feel, oh, we have so many uh, Dickensian families, mm -hmm. you know, right. in our neighborhood right. uh, who are indebted, you know. We have uh, uh, some people, you know, who... Neg negligently torturing their children at you early. Mm. Uh, the children are not sent to school at you early, you know? So there are, there are so many uh, cases, you know, uh, which I can resonate, you know, mm. uh, with, with the characters right. in the old British literature. So this is right. the main point, this is the major cause uh, behind my interest, you know, mm. in the English literature at you early. So 19th yeah. century British yeah, literature 19, yeah. resembled 21st yeah. century yeah. Yangon neighborhoods. Yeah, 20 century, I was 20th say. century, right. 20th century. It, it, yeah, it still remains yeah, very much uh, reflected of the 21st century uh, Bama as well at you early. Right. So that's how... I came to love the British literature at you early. Right. And you also referenced that, and I'm wondering if this has changed now, you referenced really not caring for modernity and actually um, had uh, held in some kind of regard Ted Kaczynski, who was the Unabomber, who wrote some treatises against the, the advent of modernity and that you... You um, to say nothing of his terrorism, which I'm sure we both abhor, but in terms of his theory that it, it, it would it be fair to say that you shared a sense of his fear and disdain for what the modern world was bringing? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Our generation uh, first st uh, started struggling actually, you mm. know, very painfully with this modern culture actually. The new generation, they will, they will struggle mm. even more painfully. The new generation, not just the Bami generation, mm. of the entire world. Sure, sure. The entire world. They will miss so many gifts, the nature, you know, mm. endure us with the humanity, which have now been destroyed mm. by all these, you know, modern, you know, modern war, actually, modern, modernity, actually. Mm. Uh, for example, if you, if you want to live peacefully, then we need a peaceful environment. And also, 100 years ago or 150 years ago, actually, people get so much from the nature very mm. easily, actually. Mm, right. You know? But now, uh, we we become completely slaves, actually, mm. you know, uh, to to the work, mm. or, you know, to our survival methods, actually, uh, just for the sake of survival. Mm. And then we just die, actually. Mm. You know? There is no space for the uh, greater such as, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, greater causes at you early, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that's how, how I'm very, very much worried about at you early, you know. Right. So this is really interesting because then as you were, I think you were starting to enroll in university in 1996. And... So you're interested in, you know, the concepts of 19, uh, the concepts of 19th century British literature. You're you're concerned about um, the the role of nature being diminished by modernity. Uh, I, I take it your Dhamma practice probably hadn't really gained form yet at, at this stage, 
but kind of set the scene for for who you were and what was happening right as you start to and you know when you're you're a young man at this time you're um, you know what 21 22 something years old this is a time at any any country in the world where you're you're struggling with your identity you know who you're having new ideas take hold of you and you're you're you know people of that age are, are kind of trying these ideas on for size and seeing who they are and how they fit and what they believe and this is all happening to you as you enter university, but your university experience was not a normal experience that you'd have in other countries. So maybe you can share a little bit about that time. Yeah, you were looking for a fun ground at you early, mm-hmm. you know, uh, to, to stamp at you early, uh-huh. to stamp at you early. Uh-huh. So in those days, we were under the impression that we were just looking for a uh, better political system. Mm-hmm. That was not enough for me, mm-hmm. you know. I always felt there must be higher goals. Mm. There should be higher goals. Mm. Just besides all these, you know, political changes at mm. early, you know, uh, political objectives. There should be higher goals for for me at early. Mm-hmm. What is that at early? Mm. What is that? What is that? So I, I am struggling with with all these identity questions, mm. who I am, right. you know, what I am striving for. Which is know, normal at that yeah, age. Yeah. So in throes of Mm-hmm. Such as actually, you know, mm-hmm. such and for for something actually, yes, right, you know, right. something, so in those days, yeah. But that was happening at a time to- at a very difficult time in Myanmar history. So it wasn't just a normal young man trying to find his way in the world. Um, maybe you can describe a little bit about what was the university and educational system like in Myanmar at the time that you were just becoming a student. I went to the university actually, you know, uh, I wanted to become a novelist actually. Mm-hmm. How- but that was not a very uh, intense goal at you early. Uh, I wanted to find like-minded individuals. Mm. You know, you cannot find the like-minded imbi- individuals in a, in a small neighborhood. Mm. You know, uh, the greater, you know, uh, the space, you mm-hmm. know, uh, the geographic area at right. you early, you right. know, uh, a greater chance mm. of you finding similar uh, mm. li- uh, like-minded individuals. Sure. So this is the... This is the main purpose of me going to the university. Which is normal. That's why kids everywhere go to university. Yeah, not for education that you were. Okay, in. sure, sure. Yeah, not for education and not even for the politics. Mm. Political was but the secondary reason right. that you were, right. you know. I, I wanted to engage with the uh, people of my, my generation that right. you were. You and what, what happened when you got there? Is that, did, did was, you find what you're looking for? Uh, it was a complete disappointment. Mm. Disappointment. First, the system is so bad at mm. early. The university was uh, no different than a concentration camp, or uh, I would say a prison at early. Mm. How so? Uh, students were f- were forbidden to visit each other if they if they belong to the uh, different faculties. For example, uh, I belong to the uh, I belong to the arts and humanities. I cannot go and visit my friend at the science department. Mm, why not? Uh, many lecturers, uh, university lecturers, so uh, d- during their spare time, they have to work as security guards oh. at their respective department, uh-huh. early, to prevent the students uh-huh. of different uh, 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 different faculties coming in at you early. Mm. Any sort of mobilization was s- suppressed at you early. Mm. Any sort of mobilization, mm. mobilization. Right. The, the 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 university lessons were so awful at early, so awful. There was no library at all. No library at all. Just for the namesake at early, the universities were running at early. You know they were uh, they they can, they could not they can they cannot be even compared to a normal high school mm. to a good high school at early. Mm. They are way below the standard of you know even the high school level at early. Mm. Mm. It was first. It was a huge dis- disappointment, hmm. but I can tolerate hmm. easily because it is expected. But my bigger disappointment is people of my generation are not disappointed as, as much as I was. Uh, so you're early. you're disappointed <laughs> that other people aren't as disappointed as you. Yeah, yeah. other people find this is all normal. Uh, uh, early, you uh, know, uh, uh, they will and I go off these of these years, you know, at the university mm-hmm. and uh, finish the school with just a certificate or with just a signature from the university I mean, the department. 
it's all meaningless actually. Mm. In those days, people really crave for this university certificate mm. because you have no access to the outside world mm. at all. Mm. No mm. other education opportunities, mm. no private school. Mm. Very difficult to even to get a passport uh, to travel. When everything is was so scarce and limited, mm. this certificate so important. Is, is so important. Right. Many people are chasing after, but I never care. Not because I'm genius. I never care actually mm. for mm. the certificate or for finishing a class or school. I never care actually. If I find something interesting, I will study it without thinking about how it is will be useful mm. for the exam or that exam or this exam. I wouldn't care actually. Yeah, you just had a love of learning. Yeah, you yeah. had love of knowledge. So, so I find people, you know, my own generation, hmm. very, <laughs> very terrible actually. This is the biggest disappointment actually, hmm. but not everyone actually. Hmm. There is also always a very tiny minority of students uh, uh, who share uh, the same sentiment, actually. Mm. Right. So what did you do when you found yourself in this kind of situation? Actually, I was always, I was always getting angry. And then I realized I should not spend time either at the campus or I should not spend time for all these university lessons, actually. Mm. I should do something meaningful, actually. Mm. So I will go to, uh, go to uh, downtown areas of Yangon and go to the book street. Hmm. And then got hold on the, you know, a pencil down, uh, pencil, uh, uh, very old books. Yeah, you know? right. I bought a collection of Dickens that you were, <laughs> which were published in the light in nineteenth century, oh, wow. nineteenth century in Bombay. Original uh, book, yeah, original yeah. books with, wow. the, uh, with all the leather yeah, stuff, yeah. uh, etc. Uh. Uh, so uh, I, I try, uh, you know, I collect. Uh, Mopper songs, uh, check calls, uh, uh, toss tries, uh, etc. Because most of the books, most of the books those days are uh, either British or the Russian that you early. In those days, we have a lot of Russian influence, ideologically, mm-hmm. actually, mm-hmm. here in our country. Well, some great literature. Yeah. So I spent time, you know, I spent time uh, going through all these books that you early. Actually, I did not, I did not manage uh, to understand that you early. <laughs> But I never care. Mm. One thing flicker in my mind. Mm. Understanding is understanding the content is not my job. Reading is my job. And that the same concept nouns in the meditation. Mm. Meditating is my job. Whether there is progress or not, <laughs> whether I got enlightenment or mm. not. Mm. No. So it's just putting in the effort. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to observe the sila right. as much as possible. Mm. Trying to meditate. But Correctly, as you're in a correct way, right? Whether there is progress or not, right? So the same concept I can mm. apply, you know, mm. with all these books, yeah, reading, trying to struggle with all these books, mm. uh, reading through these hundreds of pages of books, you know, when I when and, what, I had, and can I ask what language were these books? Were these in Burmese? English? In English, okay. English. The Russian literature also in English. Yeah, yeah. English. So, but I I started to understand, you know, all, all these things within. A matter of two years at you early, mm. you know, you learn naturally at you early. You know, the unconscious mind is absorbing at you mm. early. You trying to, you trying to read carefully, even though you don't understand. You know, you trying to, you trying to gauge at you early. Mm. You know, the contest at you early. It was so difficult to read all these books. Mm. First, because of the language barrier. The second, you don't know the contest at all. Sure. Contest at all. Yeah. You don't know what's going on. Mm. You don't know the history at mm. You never learn the history. Yeah, and there's in your no school. way to find out. Uh, so it's so difficult. Right. So from that time of being a young student to disappointed in um, not just the university education, but also in your contemporaries, um, from that point, somehow you got yourself into very difficult circumstances of eventually finding your way into a prison cell. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about um, how that journey took place. So I was 19 and 20. It was in 2000. Uh, sorry, it was in 1997, 1998. Uh, I went to university in 1996. But a few months after, I, uh, you know, I, I was attending the university. The university were all shut down mm. because of the student protests, uh, in one of which I participated. And then two years later, Aung San Suu Kyi issued an ultimatum. Aung San Suu Kyi, Aung San Suu Kyi, issued her party, her party issued an ultimatum, saying that the military must convene the parliament based on the results of the 1990 elections, in which her party 
when he last night betrayed. They must convene uh, at the parliament based on the results, hmm. that particular elections that you were within a period of 45 days. And then she was holding solo hunger strikes on the outskirts of Yangon. So I wanted to support her, not because I'm a fan of hers or I'm a supporter, or just, just the different strands confronting each other. Hmm. A woman confronting you know, an army of uh, 300,000 or 400,000. So hmm. I just want to uh, support a weaker person. Hmm. And then I found an opportunity to express my anger of everything, actually, you know, hmm. all the circumstances I grew up with, hmm. you know, etc. So I, I was involved in a student protest. And then I was thrown into jail and sentenced to 21 years on three charges. The first charge is uh, breaking the National Security Act. Another is related with the printing and publishing, you know, law, etc., violating the printing and publishing act, etc. Mm. Because I was caught with some anti-government pamphlets at home actually, during a raid by the military intelligence mm. in 1998, uh, September actually. So, and then I was sent to, I was sent to three different prisons. First, in insane prison here in Yangon. And then later to Mandalay Prison, and then to Nijan Prison. Mm. Right, all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. And what were those prison conditions like? Uh, the first two years were very, uh, very horrible, actually. Very horrible. Yeah. In Nijan Prison, where I was transferred in ni- 1999, April, I was beaten, actually. I was beaten. Mm by a group of criminals mm. under, the, under the direct supervision of the prison officers, actually. I was beaten like a dog. I was dragged to an um, open fee, uh, beaten up, actually. Beaten up, beaten up. So I, f- I came into contact with the first serious doka. Mm. Uh, doka, 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 and then Oh, I am just 20. I am going to serve 21 years. <gasps> mm. How can I survive? Mm. So suicidal thoughts came to me. It is not because I was fed up with everything. I just thought I should not suffer, you know, for all these coming years like this. Mm. At least mentally I can get out if I commit suicide. Right. So, but I was not that bold enough uh, to commit such an act. I never thought it was also a right decision at you early. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I was, I was stabbing at you early. I was stabbing uh, in those days, so much so that I felt like biting my own thigh at you early. Mm. Oh, my thigh is here at you early, mm. you know? Why do I keep it at you early? Mm. You know, just the human instinct sure. of craving of something at you early. Yeah. You know, when you when you were deprived of everything at you early. Mm. You know, and then uh, that was a very big, powerful experience. And then I started undergoing the process of soul searching at you early. Mm. Soul searching. Soul searching after yeah. one year. Nobody is beating you, Sewen. Why are you, you know, wriggling? You know, wriggling, you know, all alone. Mm. Now you are just confined to a cells. But why are you suffering? You know, you just keep quiet at you early. I was reminding myself at you early. And then, yes, what is happening? Now I have proper food. My family came, they gave me some food. Now I have food now. Yes, a few weeks ago I was stabbing. Now I have a few, uh, uh, you know, some food now. I can survive now, at least for a week. You know, I, I was not going staff at you early. So why do you keep grumbling at you early, you know, crying at you early? And I realized, not because I was being beaten, not because uh, I, was, uh, I was not having enough food, but because I was cut off access to the usual stimuli I was so familiar with. Mm-hmm. Uh, before I got thrown into jail, I was very much attached to my radio actually mm. radio uh, to all these you know mm. 
literature books actually yeah. i was so much attached actually mm. so so much attached so these are only two types of stimuli mm. i was uh, dep- uh i was dependent upon actually right. there was no internet back at that time yeah so all these stimuli you know mm. i lost mm. i lost actually mm. mm. you are i started to tell him i said you are you are suffering not because you are being beaten that mm. not because you are not having good food but because you were cut of your usual stimuli mm-hmm. so i was shocked that what is the type of freedom i want mm. the freedom i want is this outside at you early so that is not the real freedom that is not freedom because something outside something external can be taken from you at any point mm. for for any reason mm-hmm. at you early mm-hmm. at any point of your life that dependence that type of dependence the type of attachment is so fragile at you mm, early mm. and then i realized okay now i realize i was looking for not just for the democracy not just for the liberty i have to find for the type of freedom by which i mean you will no longer depend anything outside outside of your mind and body your body and mind so this is the first thought which came to be after a year or so It's interesting because you're describing being in really difficult circumstances and using kind of a thought process or thought experiment to investigate this cause of suffering and a way out of suffering but as you're doing this you don't it, 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 correct me if I'm wrong but it sounds like you don't really have access to a dhamma teacher you don't have access to a therapist you don't have access to any pen and paper or even appear to have the discussions you don't even have access to any dhamma books at this time to be able to refer to so it sounds like you're you're doing an entire dhamma investigation therapeutic psychological investigation entirely on your own and and coming out with this is that correct is that the something very strange took place six months after i got thrown into jail mm. it was insane that's the name of the jail is insane yeah, insane mm-hmm. in saint in saint prison yeah very notorious here somebody was talking about the story of sunlong siado mm. uh the arhat mm. from from the town of mianjian in upper in upper myanmar somebody was talking about how sunlong siado reached enlightenment even though he was just a uh, just a farmer this is someone in the prison that's telling you this nice to me okay uh, jail jail some fellow right uh, a political prisoner. Okay, okay. So he was talking about that. And then I was so intrigued with the story. So, you know, and then I immediately went to the corner of my says. <laughs> and then I just sat down, mm. uh cross like this is the first time. <laughs> this is the first meditative push up. Wow. <laughs> and then at that moment, mm. something very strange happened. Mm. Complete dissolution. took place immediately at you early just can you describe that experience of dissolution i felt like i was in the gal- galaxy mm. galaxy mm. and then i hear the sound of all the activities within my physical body mm. every every sound at you early even the smallest uh, the, the movement of the smaller veins i hear everything so the thigh areas and the the head area the lung area bigger sounds it's like a drum you know being played just next to me very loud sounds mm-hmm. they are moving actually from side to side actually you know mm-hmm. and then the, the the philosophy when we were you know uh, the but what is philosophy we are familiar with uh, uh, since childhood was you know, there is only one mind when you are thinking about one thing actually you cannot think about another thing but at that moment my mind has like millions of minds mm, actually mm. you know they are embedded they are embedded with all these physical experiences the awareness actually. is moving very yeah. fast it sounds yeah. like yeah so millions of minds are taking place a uh, set emotion actually mm. so i am aware of and also there is no something like uh something firm it's all broken actually you know you are like in the galaxy actually galaxy this very uh, you know just one or two moments actually mm. What happened? So that was the moment you sat down. Yeah, you sat down. Yeah. I I just closed my eyes, mm. and then this took place. Mm. And then I op I close I I open my eye very clo- very quickly, and then I I question what happened. And how long had you been in prison at this point? 
just six months. Okay. No meditation right. before, ever before. Ever in your life, yeah. Ever before, N- right. not even Anapana. Yeah. I did. I never knew about even Anapana. Mm. That was a few moments, actually, mm-hmm. a few moments, and then I realized oh, there are many things in the insides. You know, I was always looking for something, something strange actually in the outside world. Mm-hmm. I was always angry with the martial regime because you know I was cut off communication to the outside world. Mm-hmm. So I don't know much about the outside world. You know, uh, so my my access to information has been denied. So I was so angry. now I realize there are so many things inside. What's going on? Mm-hmm. And then I asked uh, some elderly persons in the prison, political prisoners in their 60s and 70s. Something happened to me. Do you know what happened? You know, I have this experience. And that they said, they don't know actually. Mm. So that's it. But I, 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 you know, I, I did not practice anything actually. Only a year and a half later actually, I got a very heated argument with a fellow political prisoner just for the meaning of Communism at uh, argue, argue, <laughs> uh, 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 democracy, uh, etc. You know, <laughs> right, so I, I, I got a, I got an argument. I got a heated argument mm. with him. I first I was bullied, you know, mm. <laughs> just verbally bullied mm. by this person actually. Mm. You know, who he's a three times political prisoner. Mm. <laughs> he's been to you know mm. prison for three times. Mm-hmm. You know, so I felt like I was being bullied actually. Mm. So I got a very, I got very angry with him. Uh, so much too that. My blood was boiling over, particularly boiling over. Mm. And then I realized I must calm down. Mm. I must calm down. I must calm down. And then I already got some Dhamma books by that time. You know, the ICRC came in. Mm. So through their negotiations with the. Who is this? The ICRC? Uh, the International uh, Comedy for the Red Cross. Right. So they were able to negotiate yeah, and yeah, provide yeah. access to certain yeah, kinds yeah, of books. Yeah, how, yeah. And what? how many years were you in prison before you had access to reading? In 2001, actually. So almost two years. So two years without any yeah, yeah. reading or writing materials. Yeah. I think you had referenced before that it was um, prisoners who were caught with a pen and paper had a greater punishment than those caught with a knife. Exactly. Yeah. During the first two years, mm. actually. Mm. You know? You... Any type of any piece of paper is illegal actually. Mm. Not just the paper. Mm. You know, they uh, we were allowed to keep like a few clothes and then some food, etc. Anything besides this item is illegal. Mm. So when my family came, uh, they bring snacks, the, in all these snacks, they have this logo and that's the that logo with the paper actually. They will always take out oh, actually. Right. So that the political prisoner I could not communicate right. with each other, but we do communicate at you early. Uh-huh. You know, we we write on the pl- we write something on the plastic pans, a uh-huh. plastic uh, uh, plastic place at uh-huh. you early. You know, uh-huh. I don't know how do you use. You know, in, in our country, uh, people chew beetle, uh-huh. so they use lie at you early. You know, a uh-huh. white color. Right. So, so from the people who who uh, who chew, you know, who, who make beetle, uh-huh. uh, we borrow lie and then pieces at you early. Uh-huh. You know. Uh, use the uh, to on the on the plastic place, uh-huh. and then you can use a uh, some sort of uh, small bamboo stick to write something at you mm-hmm. early, mm-hmm. so you can still communicate at you early. Right. But right. I think we are just like fools at you early. We are just trying to stimulate each other uh-huh. because we don't have anything uh-huh. uh, internally, uh, something tangible we can depend on at you early. Yeah. So we are just trying to uh, stimulate with each other. In those days, at you early. Right. So in 2001, I see, uh, you know, uh, thanks to ICRC's efforts, uh, we were allowed to read just only the Mar books. Mm. The, the Mar books with the logo of the Ministry of Religious Affairs. Mm. None other the Mar books, at you mm. early. You know? <laughs> so only with the C of right. the, you know, uh, uh, logo, C and logo of the Ministry of Religious Affairs. Because in most of these the Mar books, you have the approval, you know? Uh-huh. Uh, this is the license number or, you know, right. uh, approval, approval number from the Ministry of Religious Affairs. Right. Only this type of religious books were allowed at Right. I managed to, you know, read those books at early for the first three or four years at early. So that was good at early. Mm-hmm. I could not read any, any other book at mm-hmm. early. Mm-hmm. So I spent time. 
I was forced actually to read these Dhamma books, uh, Abhidhamma, and mm-hmm. sometimes even Vinaya, mm-hmm. etc. So that it was so boring, all these <laughs> books, you know, without yeah. really meditating experience. Right. It was so boring. You cannot understand. Right. Did you yeah. begin to practice based on these books or based on your first experience uh, that, was, that was so powerful? Uh, actually, after my argument with the fellow political prisoner, and then I realized I must practice meta meditation. Mm. And then I found myself full of anger. Mm. How can I practice meta? And then something flicker. I managed to improvise something actually. Mm-hmm. According to the Dhamma books, you cannot practice meta meditation if you have anger or ewe. But I cannot accept that. I cannot accept that. I have no other meditation technique to come out of anger. So I must do something. And then I saw some. Uh, vocabularies in the Dhamma book. It's called Aloba, Amoha. Loba is the Greek. Mm. Yeah, anti, you know, no, non Greek. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. the Buddha does not preach just about the uh, 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 Greek or, you know, uh, anger. He also talks about the values of non uh, uh, Greek. Yeah. No, uh, no anger. Yeah. You know, no hatred. Yeah. No hatred and mitta might be uh, mm-hmm. synonymous, but they are not the same as right, really, right. you know? Yeah. Sometimes you cannot start with the, with the love, mm. with the pure love. Mm. So you have, to, you have to start with a lower level. Mm, no sure. anger. Yeah. No anger. Yeah. You know? Uh, no Greek, actually. Uh. Uh, so I found, okay, I have full of anger. So I must turn it around. Okay, I am now suffering. I am, uh, I am suffering from confinement. I am suffering from starvation. I am suffering from anger. So I am having all these miseries. All the people in the outside world or in, in the prison, may they be free from the suffering I am now undergoing. Mm. May they be free from the anger mm-hmm. which is afflicting me. Anger is so intense. Mm, I imagine. So intense. So may they be free from this type of anger. Mm. May they be free from, uh, may, may they not be the people who, you know, who inflict mental injury and physical injury on individuals, mm. other individuals. Because they will get a lot of problems, actually. Now I am suffering because somebody put me to jail, actually. Mm. So I realize about all these pains, actually. So may, may they not be the people who does misery to others or who receives the misery from others, actually. May they be free from all the miseries undergoing. Mm-hmm. I, I know, you know, with the tears falling, occasionally fa- falling from my eyes. Actually, may they be free. May they be free. And then something flicker. Mm. I must do this around the clock. Mm. <laughs> around the, I have nothing else to sure, to sure. do. Actually, yeah. you know, I have nothing else to do. Mm. Just a few Dhamma book. You know, I have read over and over again. <laughs> sure. So, you know, I have no, no other food, you know. Mm. So I must do this. I have no appointment, nobody to talk with. So I must do this day and night as long as my eyes are open. Mm. My practice must continue, continue actually. When I have food, I must mentally think that people have access to food mm. like me. Mm. So, etc. When I sleep, oh, I have not beaten today at you early. Like a year ago, mm-hmm. people get a chance to sleep like this. Mm-hmm. You know, I miss my family members. I miss my mother. I, I started feeling pain. People be liberated from the separation with the loved ones. And then, after two or three days, my, I am physically over one with love. Hmm. I feel, you know, the Myanmar is so hot, actually. Hmm. It's a very tropical area, actually. Sure. There are a few very low rainfall, actually, you know, during the rainy season. So the heat was so intense, actually. Hmm. But at the peak of my meta, actually, I felt like I have air condition, air condition, hmm. air condition, very small and powerful air conditioners install all the pores of my skin, actually. Hmm. Wow. And then I felt like I was put in a vacuum, actually. Vacuum. You know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they are following me. Mm-hmm. They are following me. As long as I am with Mita, actually. You know, I am in a very cool atmosphere. I started feeling enjoying all the pleasant, oh. uh, pleasant sensations, actually. Uh-huh. And then, when I fall asleep, it's like a few, huh. 
a few minutes, mm. even though it's the sleep is as long as eight hours, mm. and then I realize about the meaning of sleep. If we have mental problems, if our sila is not pure, even if our sila is pure, if our mental de- mental defilements continue to exist, we cannot have proper sleep mm. because they disturb us. You know, every time actually, whenever possible actually, mm-hmm. they, they are disturbing us at the very deep level of the unconscious mind actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, you know, uh, having a sleep is like walking through a very clean, you know, uh, uh, very clean, I would say, uh, grassy lawn, you know, a lawn actually, you know, it's a proper lawn, proper, proper well-maintained lawn, actually, very clean. You just walk through the lawn. Mm. It's like 50 feet. You walk through the lawn, Another people walk through the same area, but all the muddy, you mm. know, filled with all these stones and spice and, you know, maybe snakes and poisons. So the same area, mm. you know, people cross it. You name it, this area, this is your sleep area. Mm. This is your sleep area. We pass through this this area, but I passed through very quickly. Mm-hmm. And you were in Mianjian. This is Mianjian. the hometown of yeah, yeah. Sunlun Sayada, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Ah. So, um... Then after how many years into your prison did you start this intensive meta practice? Uh, in two thousand one. Mm-hmm. In two thousand one. And from that time, did you continue every day? Uh, I continue, but I I became obsessed with the dhamma actually, mm. and then I realized anapana should be the main base, the, the main base of all the meditation techniques. Mm-hmm. My my concentration became very strong mm. with the meta, and then. Read, reading through books and uh, I felt just the necessity to sit down as you early mm. you know during my midday meditation practice I always walking up and down up and down even though my concentration became stronger and stronger but I thought I need a sitting pusha mm. for that anapana should be the most conducive as you early mm-hmm. so I practiced I began to practice anapana as well mm-hmm. very deep level of concentration I got but after two years I have I start having problems. Mm. How did you s- learn how to practice anapana? Just by reading or trial and error experiment? Just reading. Mm. Just reading. Was there a particular sayada or dhamma teacher that you were? No, following? no. Mm. So, uh, you know, numerical observation. Mm. You know, uh, uh, the breath go in and go out. Mm. I say one. Mm. You know, mm. and then uh, you you say from you count from one to nine. Mm. So right. After nine, you, 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 uh, another round right. from Sounds, one to now. Is that Lady Sayada? No, oh, I, just I, I just found it actually. Okay. I, I don't remember. Okay. So, so it's so easy. But you begin to actually uh, feel all the sensations. Mm. But I don't know what is the sensation. Sure, sure. Sensation at all. Right. But I felt like, you know, you know, my concentration is like, it's a threat. Mm. It's a threat. Uh, being dragged through a pillow, actually. Mm. Uh, pillow, mm. you know. I, I sometimes I saw my mother, you know, uh, she is stitched at the pillow at you early, you know. So you can imagine, you know, inside the pillow, mm. all this stuff, I don't know how, how to call it in mm. English at you mm-hmm. early, you know. Mm-hmm. The uh, stuffing and, and stuffing, yeah. etc. Mm-hmm. You know, so you take it out. How do you feel mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Like little it. by little, thread by thread, uh, yeah. I felt like my heart is bloating mm-hmm. and going to different directions. Mm-hmm. And then my chin is going down into, you know, uh, going down. And then I have to control, you know, uh, so that my meditation does not get damaged by all these very intense meditation, as you were, mm. uh, no, intense sensation, as sure. you were, you know, yeah. intense sensation. I felt like I have no longer breath, as you mm-hmm. you know, yeah. <laughs> to take it, as you were, you know. I felt like uh, oh, my abdomen is getting length that at you early, mm. like you know, maybe three feet or five feet. Oh, maybe a satra. Mm. So uh, it sounds I mean it, it's incredible. It sounds like for, for years, day after day, you're doing yeah. this intensive meditation practice yeah. without any teacher, without any other fellow meditator, without anyone to report, without even really knowing what your methodology is. You're you're just reading this um 
um, you know, you're reading the Dhamma books you have that aren't necessarily meditation guides. They're, exactly. they're, they're more these very technical, you know, um, yeah. kinds of literature about Vinaya and, and other things. And you're just trying to piece together by yourself in your jail cell how to form a practice out of it. And then when the results come and you're having these experiences you don't understand, you're having to be your own island and, and finding a way to continue. I, I felt like I was going to be crazy. Mm going to be crazy. I found the power of the concentration. Mm. I felt like my eye became scanner. Mm -hmm. It's a real, can real, right. sc real scanner. So if I'm reading really a book, I made a determination that my concentration should not move from one way to another. So I I play with my, I started playing mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. you know, with mm -hmm. my meditation. I started mm -hmm. craving mm -hmm. from the, for the power of, well, craving uh, for the power of concentration. And I made a determination that my concentration must be undivided concentration, going from one word to another, and then at the end of the at the end of the page, I should be able to memorize everything. Mm. So, I I preserve that sort of concentration at one point. Mm. At one point. Wow. So so I was in a delirium actually, wow. delirium, and then I was always uh, looking at my meditation place. Which which is made with my blanket actually. Mm -hmm. I only look at oh I wanted to go there all the time actually. Mm. All the time. And then at one point, you know, within five minutes or a few minutes after I sat down, I have the high very high concentration. Mm. But at one point, no concentration. Mm. What happened? Sure, it's changing. And then I try to force myself mm. to concentrate. The stronger the force, I study have a bigger problem. Sure, yeah. Bigger problem. Where is my concentration? Mm -hmm. Where is my concentration? And then, oh, if I cannot concentrate, I will continue to meditate. Another hour, another hour, four hours, three hours, okay, throughout the night. Mm. And then, at one point, I exploded. I, I, I collapsed, actually. <laughs> you know, mm. at the meditation place, actually. Mm. And then I started crying. Why should I play with all this meditation? This is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Somebody, told me, don't do meditation. This is very dangerous. You will go crazy. Mm. You know, if you don't meditate uh, with the guidance of a teacher, mm -hmm. I don't care, actually. Mm. Now, my friend's suggestion is now proven to. You see the value I of it. I'm going crazy. Yeah. You know, I even it's mentally insulted Buddha, actually. Mm. And then, I try. I try. I regain, restore my concentration. But very strong, Sankara, at the time, I don't know what is Sankara, came up to the surface. I wanted to kill people with the shepam materials. Mm. Somebody walked in front of my cell with a spade. And then I just imagined, I ran to the person and then killed him with a spade. Mm. Somebody walked just empty handed in front of myself. That person and my cell is separated by a buff wire. Then the imagination came out that I took out the buff wire and the key hang at you early. And then I walk up and down in my cell. I cannot walk because I felt like I was walking on the house of Buddha. Mm -hmm. Buddha. Whenever, you know, I'm uh, I peace at you, I made peace at you mm -hmm. early. Oh, I cannot walk. Mm -hmm. I cannot. What happened? What happened? Oh, my middle meditation is gone. My anapana meditation is gone. I started pouring through my dhamma bowls. Mm. What are the consequences for these mm. bad thoughts, actually? Mm. Am I going to hear? Mm. And then, so how did you get out of that? And then I tried uh, another form of meditation called katina. Atika or katina. Right. It's called uh, just scanning your, all your bones, actually. I, I realized... Maybe I must so, I might be so attached with the you know with with the concentration, so so that I get an understanding of the real nature of this this body framework. I should practice you know this uh, this meditation technique called you know just observation of all your bones actually mm. Mm. you know all your bones. So this is the first exper th This is the uh, this this may be the first entry into Vivasana because you first start. St scanning mm. just your bones at you early. Right. Uh, I, I, I scan all these bones, uh, uh -huh. etc. And then stay all these 
you know, Sankara's cane. And then I tried to force out all these things. And then at one point, uh, I found in the, in the Dhamma book that, you know, just this word, neglect. Don't give importance. Mm, neglect. Yeah, neglect. Yeah, yeah. Don't give importance. Uh-huh. If you give importance, they will get stranded. Mm. Do your work. Mm. Because they are they are also they, they also have the nature of impermanence. Mm. I found that. And mm. then I realized, okay, I would no longer care about, about all these thoughts, you know? Mm. But that this is insulting Buddha or any other person. Right. Or, so and then rising, uh, passing. This yeah. is not I. So how then, many hours a day are you meditating at this point? Uh, just three hours mm. actually. Mm. But you know, when I was in throes of all these mm. mental problems, sure, sure. I would meditate like four or five. But I would always uh, take uh, uh, take a precise mm. every Tuesday or Wednesday. Actually, mm. At least once a week or two days a week. Mm. And then on those days, I would meditate as much as possible mm. actually. Right. You know, as possible. Right. So you carried on this regimen until the end of your prison years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So from 2001 up until 2005, when I got released in a general NST. So in 2003 and 2004, I knew that I was going to, I'm, I was going to be released, even though I was serving a 21-year mm-hmm. GSNMs, because some of my friends were already released in an in a NST, actually, in a previous NST. So I might be released in an NST, but I felt like I don't want to go out. Oh. I don't want to go out. Now I'm having all these, you know, very interesting mm. experiences. Actually, I'm in two minds, actually. I want to, I want to get liberated, mm-hmm. you know, from the prison. But at the same time, all these experiences were kept quickly, you know, you know, uh, under my and the, and the, you know, in the DDD war, actually, you mm-hmm. know, in the DDD war. So I should, I should hold on. Mm-hmm. How can I, how can I keep holding all these experiences, actually, you know, after I get out mm-hmm. of the prison. One part of my mind I don't want to go. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get out. Mm-hmm. I, this is so good, actually. Now I, I begin used to the, the prison life as well, actually, you know. Mm-hmm. So I managed to adopt, my, adapt myself to the conditions of prison life as well. And I also found the good experience of meditation as well. So one part of my mind I don't want to go. Mm. I don't want to go. Mm-hmm. So nothing is mean- meaningful in the outside world, whether friends of the same age, you know, go to foreign countries or get this degree or that degree. I don't care actually. I have, you know, I, I, I have very, very wonderful experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I had Alan Clements on the podcast last week, and he spoke about the role of Dhamma practice in Myanmar, specifically uh, how it's different from in Myanmar here uh, than the intensive retreats uh, in other more stable countries. So, for example, someone living in a stable life in a free society, of course, they're going to be challenged during a Vipassana course to confront their greed, their hatred, and delusion. And this is not a light matter, of course. However, Uh, This is really nothing compared to someone undertaking a Dhamma practice whose own freedom, safety, home, and family can all be taken away. Uh, You've certainly undertaken your own meditation practice in very difficult conditions and environment. And so I'm curious what your view is on this and how the practice might take a different shape in these difficult circumstances versus the typical very safe retreat setting. I do not have a clear answer because... Uh, if you say people who meditate in, in, in tribal countries have a greater opportunity to develop their dhamma, I think it should be misleading, actually, mm-hmm. would be misleading. People, you know, uh, uh, who, who have access to the, you know, proper rule of law, education, etc., they, they don't stand a good chance of developing dhamma. It's also, I think, a wrong theory, actually, mm-hmm. you know? theory uh, there are pros and cons I would say actually uh, for me uh, growing up here in this country uh, I maybe I can fully appreciate uh, strongly appreciate the aspects of Dhaka Dhaka because this is the first level without the full without the understanding proper understanding or greater understanding of without full understanding of the dukkha we cannot get we cannot reach 
the liberation, mm-hmm. the liberation point at all actually. Mm. The greater appreciation of the Dukkha, the the Niara, we become actually, you know, mm-hmm. uh, to the final goal actually. You know, mm-hmm. if we combine that right. with the with the with the practice mm-hmm. actually. So here we are in a greater position, definitely actually. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. for example, just f- a few months ago, I was struggling with the hair problems actually. I I felt like I was on the verge of death actually. You know, I, I felt like. I was go- I, I was about to die actually early, about about to die. I I didn't have uh, proper access to uh, health care here mm-hmm. in this country. Mm-hmm. So and then just three weeks ago, somebody trying to kill me actually early during one of my family trips in Rakhine State actually early. I was shot uh, in my leg actually. Early. Oh goodness! In my leg just just three weeks ago oh. actually. I survived actually uh-huh. early. You know. Somebody k- trying to kill me actually, oh. so life is seems to be so fragile, yes, or precarious in yeah. this country. So you can appreciate the dukkha, and also you can appreciate, you know, uh, the nature of karma actually. You know, karma. Or, you know, for anything to happen, there must be some cause actually. You mm. know, so the the understanding, you know. So it's deeply uh, can be deeply entrenched, you know, for 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 us actually in this kind of country. I've been uh, to developed countries like Germany, Sweden, United States, uh, other countries actually. I think my imagination is if I get an opportunity to live and spend the rest of my life there, I will have a better opportunity. I think so to meditate because. You don't get disturbed mm. by you know by all the troubles of your life actually, you know you have the dilemma, mm. the greatest dilemma facing many people here in this country is I mean meditator is sometimes you want to devote yourself to the meditation, mm-hmm. but you cannot keep silent when something bad is going on actually. Mm-hmm. If your pride is very strong, if you are. A meditation label. If your priority is very mature, you can cope with it actually, mm. you know, in a quiet way, in a meaningful way. But before we gain the level of maturity, you know, mm. we are at a junction, very painful junction actually, mm. you know. Mm. I don't want to have the dilemma actually. I want to be fully with the ma actually, mm. you know. Uh, let the dhamma take its course, but I cannot. You know, let the dhamma take its school sometimes. Mm-hmm. Not because I, I I lack confidence in dhamma, but because, you know, I haven't reached the maturity in the dhamma actually, you know. Mm. So this is the problem. When there is a political turbulence, I cannot keep quiet. I want to do something actually, you know. Uh, I, I felt like that my mitta is not, you know, not enough. Right. Yeah, because your mitta is not strong, mm-hmm. you are definitely free. It is not enough. Mm-hmm. When your mitta is really strong, you are free. It is enough. Mm-hmm. You know? So yeah. then, after your prison, you came out, and I understand that eventually you took up practice at vipassana centers in the tradition of SN Goenka. Um, where did you hear about these centers, and how did you find your initial experience? Yeah, my my brother is. Also a old student of going car. Mm-hmm. So once I got out, actually I went to the nearest temples and pagodas uh, in my town to meditate every morning. Mm-hmm. Because this is the Bami's house, you have no privacy at all. <laughs> right, right. This is good actually for many yeah. purposes actually, you know? Yeah. So but the bad thing is you have no meditation place. Mm. And then you feel embarrassed, you feel shame here in a country. You know, if you are meditating, mm. you know, at a young age, you mm-hmm. feel, you know, I don't want to insult the elderly people mm. in, in the family, actually, you know. So I go out to some secluded temples and mm-hmm. pagodas in my neighborhood. And then my, my brother, who is the old student of Goenka, saw that. And then he took me to the Damajoti uh, mm. Goenka Center. And then once I read about the codes, I said, this is what I've been looking for. Mm, yeah. <laughs> this is this is the, exactly what I've been looking for. Mm. I will be completely fine, actually. Mm. You know, 
How soon after being released did you take your course? I took the course in September, actually. Mm. I was released in July. Oh, five? Yeah, yeah. four or five. So just several months? Yeah, so that was, I, I took the course, Dante course. That was the most powerful course. Yeah. One of the most powerful, one of, one of the f- very powerful courses mm. I have taken so far, actually, you know? Mm. I, yeah, because of the uh, Anapana meditation, Metta meditation, in prison, mm. I managed to assimilate it to it. It's interesting because it sounds like you were doing a lot of the components of the yeah. Goenkaji technique, yeah. but you didn't really know the order. You couldn't really make sense of your experience. Yeah. You didn't really know how to interpret what was happening to you, but you had all the pieces just organically. So it sounds like when you went into a, a, a Vipassana course in the tradition of SN Goenka and you were learning that systematically, I imagine it must have not seemed so unfamiliar. Yeah, it's like, a, you know, uh, fit a heavy young man, mm. uh, uh, joining an army actually. Mm. <laughs> You're ready, mm-hmm. you know. You yeah. accept the courses. Yeah. You know, you don't have to. You you know, you don't have to prepare yourself. You mm. don't have to spend time preparing yourself actually. Mm. You're ready mm. to accept all the all these intense mm. exercises. You're ready actually. Mm. I instantly appreciate the intensity. That's what I need. Mm. The complete silence. That's what I need. Mm. The intensity. That's what I need actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that set you on the path, path yeah, of continuing yeah. to practice yeah, yeah. Vipassana and so, Goenkaji's tradition. Yeah, and then I found this is the technique mm. which I will practice for the rest of my life. Mm. I will not change. Mm. Even Mitta mm-hmm. should be the secondary, as you, mm-hmm. early, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. So this is... Because I never reached the area of wisdom. Mm. You know, inside. Sure. Inside. I was playing with Sila uh-huh. and Samadhi, uh-huh. but never reached the the proper of wisdom mm-hmm. actually, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was those uh, Vipassana uh, courses yeah, that uh, brought you to that yeah, stage. Yeah. 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 And then you realize how the purification you know, process mm. takes place actually. Mm. You never realize. But in the prison, when, I, when my concentration is very strong, and then I started playing with the mindfulness actually, Okay, you know, if I touch something, I try to. I don't. I don't. I didn't understand about the about the sensation. I just trying to understand about the nature of the activities actually. Mm. Okay, I touch it. Now I let it go. Mm-hmm. So this is impermanent. Mm. And then at one moment, some explosion took place. Trash. Mm. It's like something being banned actually outside, mm. physically outside actually. Mm. Something banned actually mm. inside, mm. inside. Mm-hmm. Something banned. So I began to understand how the banning of the old stuff, mm-hmm. you know? The burning of the old stock of old Sankara. Stuff, Sankara yeah. takes mm-hmm. place, actually. Right. And then how the new Sankara are also formed. This was during yeah. the Vipassana course. Uh, during the but, Vipassana course. Right. Oh, I, I realized, oh, right. I have so many, so mm-hmm. many, mm-hmm. so many. And then I realized I will be stay in a position to create so many Sankaras, mm-hmm. so many new Sankaras. Mm-hmm. So the same Sankara, which has the same characteristic, they will resonate, the old and new, mm. uh, they will re- resonate with each other and they will develop, mm. they will form into right. you know, another label. So I realized, I, uh, you know, I understood all these things that you really, mm. yeah. Mm. That's wonderful. So of course, living as a Burmese person in the Golden Land, you're growing up in the birthplace of this tradition and where the lineages have been maintained. So I'm curious, being someone like yourself who is so detail-oriented, you know, reading British literature, being a journalist now, and very intellectually curious as well, uh, what did, after you started practicing this Vipassana and the tradition of SN Goenka, what did you then learn about these figures in the lineage, about the tradition, about the meditation that was all taking place in your homeland? I, I, felt very, I feel very fortunate, mm. even though I stay Burmese, mm. because... I've been to so many monasteries actually. I met many Dhamma persons, mm. but I never appreciate. Mm. <laughs> I rarely appreciate until you, know? you took the course. Yeah, yeah I right. so I can easily get. I can. I, I can easily get drowned. Mm. You know, in the shallow, you know, philosophy and practices, misguided practices. I can get easily. You know. Because there are thousands of oceans, actually. Mm, mm, in this country, yeah. In this country. Right. And then you get 
the right one. Right. So I feel very fortunate, right. actually, as yeah. much as the foreign yogis, actually. Yeah. You know, I yeah. feel very fortunate. Mm. You know, I want to Buddha. I want to monastery with my family mm -hmm. on the holidays. Mm. I never feel, you know, I, I always feel, sorry, something is lacking. Right. What is lacking? Right. You know? Just felt like an yeah. outer shell of religion yeah. or something. Yeah. There is always a feeling of no uh, dissatisfaction. Mm, mm. Something is going wrong. Mm. You know, something is misplaced actually. Mm. And those vipassana yeah. courses gave you yeah. that substance you're yeah, looking yeah. for. Yeah. So just in the name of Dhamma, so many bad things. You know, mm. can take place. Right. Can take place. Right. Sometimes people have a right confidence, right understanding, but they are just playing actually. You know, with all. All these things at a shallow level, actually. Mm -hmm. So, what's well, the most important thing is the practice, actually. Mm -hmm. The practice. Sometimes, he, he are in your country, you will see, oh, th this person has been a monk, or this person has been a meditator for 30 years, mm. for 40 years, mm. and then you feel obliged to pay respect to him, mm. to listen to his whole lecture, you know? <laughs> so, after taking going Kakos, I felt like, I am liberated mm, <laughs> from mm. all these miseries and doubts, uh, uh, you know. Yeah. I am liberated, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I can distinguish, uh, you know, whether this is a real dhamma passing or right. not, whether this right. is a real, you know, dhamma uh, philosophy, dhamma understanding or not. Mm. You know, you know, some people say, "Oh, take this course," mm. you know, go go and listen. Mm. So, you know, but you're satisfied where you I are. I satisfied. I feel very fortunate. Yeah, very very fortunate. Yeah. So you don't. I don't feel obliged to pay response to any wrong person actually mm. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what sort of you know honorary titles they mm. have mm. no matter how many years they've been mm. in this tradition or in this association right so that you've never been one yeah. for titles yeah, you weren't yeah, yeah. you weren't one for the certificate yeah. at your university yeah. and yeah. I, yeah. I never care actually right, right, right. it's just I, the I, wisdom I, that yeah, it sounds yeah. like yeah. you're after because yeah. Buddha or any Arahat you know Buddha Never got any degree actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Never got Buddha did not did not depend on any sacred or anything actually. Mm -hmm. He very much dependent on himself actually. Mm -hmm. In many cases, the priority is really given importance actually. Mm -hmm. Instead, theory, um, you know, historical understand uh, historical not history. Sorry, sorry. This social class uh, etc. They are social standing. You know, they are always given huge importance in this country. Mm -hmm. So, and this Vipassana practice yeah. kind of taught you yeah. to to look for the wisdom and the yeah. authority inside. And also to have a mm. uh, to have a uh, simple and uh, clear aptitude mm -hmm. towards all th all these issues. Actually, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. y y you got to grapple with all these things. Actually, you know. Mm -hmm all these religious issues, religious passing in this country. Mm. Now, you know how to take care. Mm -hmm. So this is the biggest gift. One mm. of the biggest gift, one of the gifts I gave from the Vivashana mm. actually, you know? Mm. Mm. Right. So Burma is a complicated country. It's a difficult recent history combined with a rich meditative tradition that has inspired mindfulness movements all around the world from some of the great teachers and traditions that have gone. A question I often get from meditators is why there is, there is not more peace in a country where so many people are at the forefront of pursuing inner peace. So there's this kind of contradiction. So what is your answer to this? Why is there such instability in a country where for so long people have tried to attain the greatest mental inner stability? Uh, this clearly shows, uh, you know, it is not enough just to be proud of, hmm. no? Uh, uh, to receive or to have received the teachings of Buddha, mm -hmm. you know, pride is not enough at all. Mm. You know, pride can easily become even a obstacle, actually, mm -hmm. even a problem, actually, mm. <laughs> in our daily -day life, mm -hmm. even in the society, actually. I was asked this question, this type of question, actually, mm -hmm. many times. Yeah, me know? too. Many times. So the simple thing is because of the, uh, this assumptions that these people are Buddhists, mm. so this is the misassumption, mm -hmm. you know, mis misconception. Mm -hmm. People in the Bama, majority of them, you know, they are traditional Buddhists. That's why they are Buddhists. So that's why they are supposed to 
supposed to be parties in, you know, all these parties. Mm. So this is the misconception, mm. you know, uh, uh, misconception right. of the people in the outside world, actually, mm, mm. you know, like, okay, Amer- America, mo- majority of people are Christians. So that's why they must practice like this or like that. Mm. So this is the misconception. The misconception just is that the, mi- just the, the, the Burmese, yeah. you're, you're saying that the majority yeah. of Burmese Buddhists are not practicing I would say, in a way that would bring in I would inner say, wisdom. Is that yeah, what you yeah. mean to say? Exactly, that, is that actually. Right. I would say, I would say, mm. I would say, you know, rites and rituals, you know, mm. uh, play a greater role, mm. you know, in the day-to-day life, actually, you mm. know. Sometimes even in a, in a very dangerous way, actually, mm. you know, if you perform this rite and that's ritual, you're against this and that, etc. You know? you know, so they are, yeah. So even though we have a, this great uh, Buddhist heritage, actually, we haven't exploited that, you know, to the to the greatest advantage, actually, mm, so uh, for ourselves. So as Myanmar continues to open and become more stable, what role do you think Vipassana meditation can play in this process? I think, you know, uh, these uh, spiritual ideas are also can be found, you know, in any sort of uh, good political system, actually. Mm-hmm. For example, you know, in a country where there is less corruption, it means that People have greater sila mm-hmm. at you early. Mm, sure. You know, greater integrity at you early. Right, right. So, so, so this uh, social and political system can strengthen the spiritual practices at you early. Mm. You know, so, spiritual practices. Mm-hmm. So they are, yeah, they were, yeah, yeah, they were. So if we have a better political system, so people will be in a greater position. You know, to immerse their self mm-hmm. uh, in the practices in a proper way. So when you have a great level of poverty, mm. when you have when you have unclashes, how can you imagine about meditation practice? Right, you right. Practice. So you're so saying that the society needs to reach some level of stability yeah, exactly, and yeah. and uh, lack of corruption exactly. in order for there to be a, exactly. enough stability for Vipassana practice exactly. to take off among exactly. the people. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, right. Um, and last question. Um, you know, there could be very peaceful meditators who have very little social awareness or interest in greater society. There can also be activists whose minds are frankly a mess, even though they're trying to make positive change in the world around. So you've been in both these worlds. You've been in the world of uh, inner peace and practicing gaining wisdom yourself in, in um, meditation. And you've also been looking at the bigger picture of political systems and what's needed to make a stable society. And I'm struck by one phrase I, I read that you had made before. You, this, you said, quote, I started soul searching. I shouldn't have been angry that much. Freedom of expression became less important to me than freedom from anger, freedom from destruction, freedom from repentance, freedom from dilemmas. I wanted a peaceful and strong state of mind. As long as my mind is weak, I cannot do anything. I found more va- I found values more important than any p- political ideology. So I'm wondering, how does one combine mental stability with also pursuing an outer stability of the country? Political prisoners, former political prisoners like me, and also the current activists, we have the desire, you know, to strive for a better society. Mm. But if we forgot about the importance of uh, purifying ourselves, you know, it will be like like a crazy man mm. uh, with a dirty coat, mm-hmm. with a very dirty coat. Mm. And then the person wandering in a very crowded area and say, Oh, I want to hear, I want to hear. But everybody gets frightened because he has dirty coat at you early. Mm. You know, you pollute the entire area. Mm. <laughs> and then you say, I want to hear, I want to hear. Mm, right, right, <laughs> yeah. right, I get it. We, we cannot, we don't need to be wait until we have, we begin our heart mm. to hear the society. Mm. But we need a certain level of purity mm. and maturity to hear others. Without that baseline, we are just we are just trouble actually the people. Mm. If we cannot have ourselves, how can we help others? Mm-hmm. So, 
uh, the biggest problem will be your sila. If you don't have proper sila, how can you hear others? Mm. For example, if you do an NGO, mm. then you will start stealing. Or if you don't steal, you will start misusing, mm. misappropriating mm-hmm. for, uh, for less concrete you know, reasons, as you were earlier. Mm-hmm. So, so, y- so you are not helping the society, as you were earlier. Right. Say, Aju Buchan is a great example yeah. of someone who is the master of both worlds, who is yeah. also heading yeah. four departments simultaneously in the government yeah. while running a meditation exactly. center as well. Yeah. So that is possible. So, you know, I, I read the biographies of revolutionaries, as you were earlier, you mm-hmm. know, uh, who fought against the British colonialism or who fought against the you know, Dutch colonialism, etc. Mm-hmm. Most of these revolutionaries have begun to date us, actually. Have, have what? To date us, you know, after the independence, uh-huh. actually. After the Second World War, uh-huh. you know, all the colonized countries uh-huh. gained independence. Uh-huh. The, the individuals who took part in the re- revolutionary wars mm-hmm. against the, you know, uh, colonizers, mm-hmm. They begin to teach us. They become dictators, yes. To teach right. us, as you were. Right, they right. Begin to, most of them begin to teach us, yep. as you were. That's very right. Even the worst to teach us, mm. the, the former colonizers, as you were. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this is the biggest lesson, as you were. Mm. You know? Mm. So we want, we want to fight the monster, you know, in, our, in the village mm-hmm. or in our town. Mm-hmm. Just because we hate him, as you were. Mm. But not because... We, uh, not because we want to be the society or the community mm. with the greater values. Mm. You can you cannot just tolerate, mm. you know, the abuses, you know, uh, against you at you early, you know, carry out against you by the monster at you early. Mm-hmm. You cannot just tolerate. You feel mm. so much anger at mm. you early mm. with the monster. That's mm-hmm. why you you are reacting. Mm-hmm. Not because you you want to you want to uh, you want to be the society with the with the different, you know, mm-hmm. proper goals that you were Right. So you fight a monster, you will definitely become a monster. Become the were. monster, right. Monster. So you. So that's not my philosophy. Mm. Maybe it's the philosophy of Nishi or etc. Mm. You know, so I like that philosophy. Mm. You know, everybody has the potential to become a monster. So I feel like, yeah, oh, right. we are dictators in uh-huh. our own small ways, uh-huh. but we still do not have the opportunity Right. To begin the, di- the, uh, the most powerful to teach If we get those conditions, who knows what, con- we'll yeah, what we'll so do. So you're saying that we might make a major change to the outside world, yeah. but the inside world stays the same. And yeah. so actually, even if the outer world changes in terms of political structures and everything else, yeah. the same inner methodology that hasn't been worked on will just keep repeating itself. Yeah. And that's why the yeah. wisdom and the shiva sure. are important. No matter what sort of political system you have, mm. Chinese or no, U.S., mm. what, the sila mm. is indispensable, mm-hmm. completely out of question at you early. Right. And the integrity, the integrity, non greek at you early. You mm. cannot be greedy too much at you early, you know, mm. if you're a government or if you're a government leader at you early. Mm-hmm. So these are compassion at you early, mm-hmm. you know, compassion, karuna, and also sila, morality. Mm. These should be our, our companions every day at you early. Mm-hmm. You know, no matter what our position, but a uh, mandate or yeah. you know, super mandate actually. Right. Without this value, how can you help the society? Mm-hmm. How can you help? Uh, uh, if you are just alone, it's all right mm. actually. Mm. But the more power you have, you know, you are in a you are in a in a position actually. You mm-hmm. know, greater position to harm without this bit. The society with all these values mm-hmm. that you were. And in a country like Myanmar, where these these meditative traditions and knowledge, as you just said, knowledge of Sheila, which doesn't exist in a lot of other countries, knowledge of mm-hmm. of of wisdom and the correct way to act. In a country like this, where this th- this knowledge is so understood by so many people, do you see this being applied by by people who are in positions to apply it? Yeah, I th- I think so. You know, but not at the society level. Mm-hmm. You know. I think uh, in countries with a better political system, actually, with a better governance, mm. I think you know, intentionally or unintentionally, they, they, they install this idea of sila mm-hmm. in their system, actually. Right, right. So you cannot say that majority of the Burmese have the greater sila mm-hmm. than those in the U.S. or, the, you know, mm-hmm. etc. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm.
Yeah. Okay. We're we're good. We'll just one last line. Let's. So, uh, uh, do you know the family? My family is, is that, is that there? your family? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let, let's just end it here. So. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So uh, we just want to thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate the time coming. and wish the best of luck with everything you have coming up. Hope that we can talk again sometime later on. And it was just great to see you. And thanks for sharing these words. Thank you very much, Josh. Yeah. yeah Josh. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We want to present a special opportunity for donors who are committed to the life of our show. While we greatly appreciate donations of any and every size, larger donations are particularly helpful. For that reason, we are encouraging donors with means to consider sponsoring a full episode for a one-time donation of $350 or more. Donations in this category can include a dedication, if you'd like, to family members or Dhamma friends, a Dhamma quotation by the Buddha or meditation teacher, even a short phone interview we can include in the episode allowing your voice to be heard. Or your generous donation can be anonymous. Should you wish to keep your name private, the choice is yours. In any case, such a generous donation would also give you the satisfaction of knowing that you enabled at least one more episode to be produced for the benefit of all the other listeners on the path. If you find the Dhamma interviews we are sharing of value and would like to support our mission, we welcome your contribution. You may give via Patreon at www.patreon.com slash insightmyanmar, as well as via PayPal at www as well as via PayPal at www.paypal.me slash InsightMyanmar. In both cases, that's InsightMyanmar, one word, I-N-S-I-G-H-T-M-Y-A-N-M-A-R. If you are in Myanmar and would like to give a cash donation, please feel free to get in touch with us. You may want to reflect a little more deeply on some of the themes explored in the last discussion. Following every interview, my friend Zach Hessler and I take some time to process the depth of what was said. Zach has been to Myanmar on numerous occasions and spent three years here as a forest monk, and so we hope that our talk can add depth and context to the interview. He's now living in rural Thailand, and I'll just make a quick call on Skype to connect with him now. Well, great again to catch up with you, Zach, and have a really enthralling and unusual one here with a lot to parse through. Yeah, it was a really interesting story. Yeah, I mean, it was really what it was. Is It, it was like a, a vivid and terrifying view of, of Burma today and Burma recently, one that we, we rarely get with that kind of access to someone on the ground with, you know, his level of experience and interest and, and knowledge, um, both today as well as really in the past couple decades. And as we talked about at the beginning of the interview with him, I had last seen him, you know, I don't know how many years ago, but it was um, the circumstances of when I last saw him. I don't think we really fleshed out in detail. There had been a article about uh, about Burma at the time by George Packer, who's quite a, uh, a famous reporter and nonfiction writer. Um, he had used uh, Sway, Sway Win as a kind of a profile piece of someone who was studying and had a history in activism. And he had basically hid his details, both in terms of where he was living and studying and what he was doing and what he physically looked like and even like his name. I think they changed one letter on his name. And when it came out, it it hit too close to home. It came out in The New Yorker. And I don't remember what year this was, you know, seven years ago or so. Um, but when it came out, it was so true to life that his uh, this was a this was before the country opened up. So whatever year it was, it was definitely before 2012. And it was it hit so close to home that his uh, safety was um, was a little bit uh, in jeopardy. And so he had to if my memory serves me right. He basically had to leave in the middle of the night. Uh, out of Burma and didn't come back for many years. So that was the last time that that I had encountered him face to face uh, when we had the interview. I think I had talked to him online. He'd gone to study in Hong Kong University and I had talked to him a little there. I remember he lamented not having Dhamma books and I tried to help him out of 
seeing how I can get some scent. But um, that was the last time we met was this article kind of landing too close to home and him escaping, uh, I don't know how, but through the cover of the night. And then we end up back here in a studio talking about his past history and Dhamma experience. Is the article about, uh, it's not the one about the guy growing cannabis there for CBD, is it? No, that's a different one. That's a that's a Colorado uh, Asian American guy in Colorado who uh, who ends up going to Myanmar with his family. I think around Pyongyang Lin and uh, yeah, develops a CBD farm. That was that was an article covering the last few years of that experience. This was this was much earlier than that, and it right. was a um, it wasn't a profile of Sway Win exactly, but it was a. Um, a it was kind of a study of Burma today and where it was going. And he was one of the lead protagonists in it, kind of seeing, understanding what was going on in the country through his prism. But it just, you know, very, very little was done to disguise who it was. And that uh, put him, um, put his life at risk and he had to escape. Right. I did. I, the, so the CBD one's even more, more recent. I did kind of, because that guy, that, that writer did flush out sort of what it's like in, in, in prisons in Myanmar, I did kind of bring some of that imagery into uh, into the story with uh, with Sway Win here. You know, and rightly so, because in that article, he was in the same prison. the The uh, American CBD grower um, that was profiled in that magazine was sent to Mianjan Prison, and the description of his prison life was very similar to Sway Win, even though it was you know ten or twenty years apart. And it was exactly the same prison. Yeah, and so the very first thing he says, it's a vivid and terrifying view of Burma today, and this is and recently, and this is even more recent. And even with a democratically elected government, there's aspects to to life in Myanmar that are really almost identical to how it how it was before. Yeah, and I think this is why it's such an interesting interview for us to get into because, in some ways the way the conversation flowed is not dissimilar to the hero's journey of other uh, Dhamma practitioners, meditators, monastics that we hear from in terms of uh, who they were in early life, how they found the Dhamma, how it transformed their life, who they were today. This follows kind of a similar track, but nowhere has this track coincided with Burma's difficult political and recent history as much as his does. We really get both views there, the view of activism and pushing for positive change, um, coinciding with uh, someone who is sitting on the cushion and following a meditation practice to look inside and purify their own mind. Alan talked about that a little bit, didn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Alan absolutely did in his interview talk about that quite a bit. Uh, his life definitely coincided with, um, you know, how his Dhamma practice was also related to his activism. And it's interesting you mentioned that interview because one of the things that really impressed me in Alan's talk, I actually can't remember. We did two interviews with Alan. Only one of them has been released so far. A second one is uh, is is going to be coming out soon, and it might have been in the second talk. Uh, so listeners might not have heard this yet. But one of the things that Alan said was about the Dhamma practice in Myanmar as opposed to in other places was just a reminder to the audience that these people are practicing in conditions that we can't begin to understand and that understanding the practice that they do, the way that they teach, the way they incorporate the Dhamma into their life, we also have to understand the oppressive regime in which they're living and that when these Dhamma teachings are coming to us, those teachings are coming without that background context in which they're being formed. And he just really encouraged us as practitioners to have a deeper appreciation for that wider context in which the teachings are being followed and propagated. Um, and I found this talk with Sway Win so interesting. I might have even mentioned it. I think I did mention during the interview with Sway Win, referencing that talk with Alan, because I found, well, here's a guy that's fitting exactly into the mold of how Alan Clements was, was speaking about a, um, a Burmese practitioner who is trying to incorporate his Dhamma practice into a very difficult, very difficult situation where his freedom is not assured and um, his basic uh, human rights and dignity are things that um, cannot be taken for granted. And as he is struggling with all of these things in such different circumstances, he's also going through the normal practice of a meditator. Well, there is no normal practice of a meditator, but these, uh, as anyone is starting to learn meditation for the first time, there are 
some kind of vaguely general stages that people pass through. And in his description of his meditative experience, there, there are some things we can grab onto that might be similar to what we hear stories from other people. But this is happening in the context of being in and out of jail and, and um, not living in a free society. And so he really is that protagonist that Alan Clements is talking about in incorporating this Dhamma practice into a very difficult, very different and difficult environment. Well, on top of that, like, it would be one thing to be in all these in in all those conditions, having had some kind of formal training in in meditation. But he didn't. He he was attracted to it, but he just had a few books and a few people to talk to, and kind of in all those difficult conditions was kind of fashioning, you know, his own practice. Which uh, I mean, he he realized he he. He struggled a bit on, uh, with some of that along the way, but he actually he did a pretty good job of, of fashioning together uh, a good Dhamma practice. And I mean, it, I was just surprised at how potent some of his uh, insights were during that period. Uh, I mean, the conditions. I, I guess uh, someone said recently about the, uh, the the recent COVID pandemic that these conditions. In a, way, in a way are quite helpful for someone who practices Dhamma. And so that he could catch Dhamma at all on his own and, and, and kind of corral some, some different practices together in those conditions. There, if you, I mean, just how much suffering there would be without some kind of practice, you know, and that transition he talks about in the beginning, um, you know, geez, I'm only 20 years old. I'm 21 years in prison. Um, how how am I gonna how am I gonna survive this? And then he has insights, you know, that are very you know very very domic, you know, like well I'm not suffering because of what the mind keeps wanting to blame it on, but I'm actually suffering because of my attachments to what's he called it to stimulus. He uses the word you know I, I didn't I don't have the stimulus I have outside anymore, mm. um, and that insight that uh, you know that what's freedom? You know, freedom is like. Is like having something you can rely on that's that can't be taken away from you. It's some, like an internal state, you know, mm -hmm. that no matter where you are. And man, like if that's not liberating in normal life, how much more so would it be um, in prison, you know, so under those conditions. So, yeah. yeah, right, right. And formulating that practice pretty much on his own from the start. You know, he did have access later to some books and maybe some people to talk to, but mainly it was just him sitting inside a cell with an awareness of how much misery and suffering he had inside and not wanting to feel that way and knowing that he had to find a way out, which is really the, if you boil down the core of what it was the Buddha taught with the Four Noble Truths and with, with suffering and the way out of suffering and accepting these truths and, and working towards a, uh, a release of them, this is what it all boils down to, but not really knowing how it is that you formulate that and actually you know the, the 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 very minimal contact he had with other prisoners that he described was them telling him that he's going to go crazy if he practices that no, you can't practice meditation it'll make you worse off but still he he proceeds ahead and trying and then later you know years down the line the red cross is the international uh, committee of the red cross the icrc is able to allow Dhamma books, very technical, as he said, very boring um, books in there that at least give him something to to hold on to. Um, and then looking at, you know, just his, just to take a moment and look at kind of a character study of what we feel or what I feel in listening to him, it's, it's really just this, this uh, huge amounts of courage and intensity and conviction, uh, clarity in terms of what he's doing is very powerful to to hear how strong those qualities were in his life and how they came around to his activism as well as his, um, you know, his meditation practice. Right. I, uh, yeah, I was, I was, I was fascinated that he, uh, he mentioned, uh, Ted Kaczynski, you know, of course we all associate, uh, most of us because of what we learn about in the media. It's just like the act of, you know, the terrorism act, which I don't condone in any, in any way, shape or form. Yet the um, the ph philosophical underpinnings of his overall worldview are are actually quite fascinating, you know. And it's and I think the more the more we go forward uh, in this accelerating world of technology, I, I think we start to see more and more like the effects of technology on us and how that um, 
we kind of lose touch with the gifts of nature, which is something that that uh, that's something that stood out for me. It's like, wow, you know, like, he's really a unique person. You just, I mean, perhaps it's some naivete and uh, stereotyping on my part. But when I come to Myanmar, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect to run across someone who had that kind of influence. You know? And it's it's quite a profound. He just has a. I mean, I guess anywhere. I mean, a lot of people are just, you know, the mainstream just kind of go with the flow kind of, you know, I think in any society he he would have been mm-hmm. like this because there's certain quality. I mean, there are some, I, what I mean is I think there's some strong internal conditions mm. he has. Now, he, he, he paints it as like, well, I just, I think I've been in the Dhamma before, something like that, right? He, ha- he thinks he's carrying some of that from, a, from past life, which may be true. But there is certainly this proclivity towards um, interesting ideas in the world, um, looking into things, being investigative. He just has this ability to learn on his own. Um, like the way, for example, he, he, he read about metta or heard about it. I can't remember how that played out, but it came to his mind like practicing metta. And he's like, I, have, <laughs> I just have too much anger to do mm-hmm. that. I can't. I don't feel metta, so I can't radiate metta. And so, you know, for some people that would be a dead end or they would need someone to tell them, okay, if you can't do that, do this. But he had the type of mind that could say, well, what can I do? Oh, over here he does talk about adosa. Uh, uh, there's loba, adosa, moha, and there's also aloba, adosa, a moha. And adosa, is, so dosa is uh, aversion or hatred. And Adosa is the opposite of that. So can I at least start with non-hatred? I can I can get there. I can get like back to neutral where the mind is feeling hatred, then I can I can find that place of non-hatred. And wow, that's already a sense of relief in me. I don't feel metta yet, but I feel adosa. And I can share that because now I'm feeling that and I can feel the benefit. And to, to get there on his own, you know, I talked be- before about having, you know, kind of being a Dhamma child or a Dhamma teenager and then sort of learning how to be a Dhamma adult. He seems to naturally have a Dhamma adolescent teenage mind where he's very investigative and willing to experiment and, and uh, fashion things on his, uh, on his own and learn from them. Yeah, certainly. And something of a, of a rebel as well, perhaps, you know, even though he's, he's certainly rebelling against the uh, educational and political system of his time. And even as he's doing, he seems to not exactly line up and align himself with uh, the leaders of the democracy movement to, to, to be a little bit, um, uh, you know, have his own unique perspective on um, that doesn't quite fit into a box with that. And when you talk about his influences, you know, he also mentioned Charles Dickens was a huge influence. And, you know, who um, some if uh, someone just came to you and said, hey, there's this this guy, who you know, Ted Kaczynski and the, the Unabomber and Charles Dickens are this guy's greatest influences, you know, <laughs> guess uh, describe what this kind of person is and, and, and what he's like in the world. You know, you wouldn't come up with this. But if you were to describe that, uh, one of the things that struck me in listening to it is it is how much he was like a typical yogi, like like you or me, Zach, or like probably many of the people listening here from the West, where would he have been placed in a situation of greater stability and security and opportunity, he would have followed some kind of similar trajectory. And what I mean by that is he's obviously a, a sensitive young man, or or as he describes himself in those years, at that time, he, uh, university, he was a sensitive young man looking for truth, looking for friends, for like-minded people to discuss, you know, the deep ideas and the meaning of life, um, wanting a proper education. And, um, and this is, this, this is something really common for people of that age, certainly in, in, in the West of, uh, you know, these kind of periods of idealism and searching that you're going through, except as he's going through this period in his life, he finds himself caught up in unspeakable historical conditions, um, of, uh, of society starting to break down around him and, um, and having him having to work out, uh, who he is and how he responds in that moment based on his ideals, based on safety, based on his goals and, uh, and then facing really, really difficult conditions in prison of starvation and beatings and isolation. Um, and so it, I think it, I think for many meditators listening to this, who went through 
a similar trajectory that you or Isaac went through of, um, of, of learning about ourselves and coming of age and maturing and having some kind of spiritual maturation as well. Obviously we're still going through that, but at, at least we can point to a before or after of when we first started practice, it does bring about a sort of natural reflection of oneself caught up in those circumstances. If I was that sensitive young man looking for, you know, looking for meaning in my place in the world and my friends and, and for sense, and then I was caught up in these times, what choices would I made? And, and if those choices led to these kind of difficult conditions, how would I have found my way out? And I, I certainly don't think I could have, um, uh, persevered as uh, Sway Wynn describes himself doing. Yeah. I was thinking about that too. Like I, I mean, I talk a lot about this Dhamma child, Dhamma adolescent thing. And, and really I have needed, uh, encouragement in my life, uh, to be the Dhamma adolescent, you know, um, and it's helpful to have the right kind of uh, parental role model there. Um, and I've had I've had some good teachers in my life that really uh, nudge me towards like experiment. My yoga teachers, you know, like hey, like look in your own body and see for yourself. You know, um, Utejaniya right now is a, you know, that kind of teacher as well. I said like you know, experiment, play around, you know. And but I'm not like that by design so to speak you know and so if i was left to my own accord i i don't know i mean maybe under more intense conditions maybe something would shift i'm not sure but yeah i'm not sure <laughs> i'm not sure what i would have done but i i i i can clearly see that 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 part of him was there before prison as well and then in prison and how it served him i'm not sure i would have the same outcome i might have i might have really i mean i might have not not uh like coalesce the same uh, powers and, and influences and, and, and brought them into the practice like you did, I think uh, I would have struggled much more. It's hard to say, you know, how things would turn out, but you know, yeah, that's just kind of what, what comes up now. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, considering that conversation on, I mentioned how he found himself this sensitive young man looking for this sense of truth and and betterment at a time when society was really breaking down and that and fast forward to um where we are now or or um what the state of Myanmar is and the way that Sway Win describes and there really is a kind of operating in a broken system so many parts of the way a normal society functions are things you don't find in in Myanmar in many developing countries that's true but certainly in Myanmar and I found that topic very interesting when it came up of asking Sway Win about uh you know the the quintessential question that um, so many meditators have of Myanmar, you know, the, the question of if um, if this is such a, a Buddhist country, so many people are practicing Vipassana meditation, there's so many wise monks, et cetera, et cetera. Why is there this level of violence? And Sui Win had a number of directions he went with that, but one was Sheila, one was the five precepts, the ethical practice that he sees in the country. And he didn't say that it was, you know, um, unequivocally low or bad in Myanmar, but he said it was lower than most people, my, most meditators might think. They might give a little more credit for how he feels it really is. And he thinks that there, there is, in some of the ways that, that society is broken down in some ways and some of the things that don't work, he is highlighting the lack of Sheila of people in positions of a power or authority um, that, are, uh, that, are, that are playing a role in that broken system by choosing to uh, perhaps benefit themselves or those around them at an expense of following a very high level of uh, of of moral quality and Sheila. And that that was an interesting take he had on it. Yeah, you know, it reminds me like the first time I went traveling, I, I went to Pakistan, which is uh, um, an Islamic republic, right? And, you know, I was trying to learn a little bit about Islam and and, and I, was, I was critical of them, not not rising up to the highest, you know, standards of their own beliefs, you know, and I think this is a, a mistake I made as a kind of a novice traveler. Um, I mean, if we call America a Christian country, we and we, we hold up the highest Christian ideals, we also don't rise to that occasion often, you know, both as a government or even as people often. And so uh, this certainly happens in Myanmar, um, except perhaps like, 
when I first went there, I was really uh, deeply into uh, uh, being a very faithful Buddhist. I was really into the, like ins- I was really inspired by a lot of more faith based things. I didn't really realize that at the time, but so I I, I just bounced around from. I was on these uh, this uh, tour with with SN Goenka and uh, about four hundred uh, of people from that tradition. And we were just bouncing around from Dhamma place to Dhamma place, listening to uh, Goenka give talks and, and meditating together. And the people were so friendly. And so when you get that, it was kind of a bubble of sorts, you know. And I, that's the impression I carried at Burma. And, and a lot of travelers, when they go there too, that people are just so nice and this and this and this. It, Unless you bump into it inadvertently, which I don't think happens to a lot of people, it really kind of takes living there and spending some time there to, to kind of see how, you know, when you look under the hood, so to speak, you know, how things are actually operating. And um, so then, you know, the, the kind of the kind of shockers is it's not what you think. And it's a matter of fact, it's very strongly the opposite it, that manifests in many ways. And then and then. And then, like, there's this other level when I when I bump into people like Sui Win that that in spite of all that, there's still this incredible stuff that happens, you know, in in that context, you know. So the first layers you don't see that at all, and you think it's all kind of rosy and then in a Dhammic way, and then you see like, well, it's actually <laughs> maybe quite a bit darker than I had expected. Um, and then in that darkness, there's there's just these incredible lights as well. So. Uh, that's something that's hard to appreciate, I think, like you said, uh, in, in so many ways internally, he's just like us, uh, but he just grew up in a completely different uh, different situation. So anyways, yeah, just kind of going through like what my mental process is and as far as like judging cultures and religions and societies and uh, yeah. Yeah, that's certainly very true that there's these different layers that coexist in the country. And I think one of the things I tell people that start to be here longer is that and they they might see one side, a lot of one side first and then a lot of another side later, and they just have no idea kind of how to put these together. And one of the things I really insist on that took me a long time to learn is that the existence of one layer does not actually negate the other one from existing, you know, the dark and the light, if you just want to want to put easy distinctions on them, although, of course, it's, it's harder than that. But it's more that these these different layers are coexisting with each other. And that's what makes it so hard to have a proper appreciation for how things really are. And that's also, you know, getting to the kind of podcast that we want to have of a real truth telling podcast of um you know, looking at what Myanmar society is like, what different um, practices are like, what mon- monastic life is like. And uh, of course, you and I have extraordinary reverence for the possibilities that are in Myanmar. If we didn't, we wouldn't be doing this podcast. So, you know, of course, we, we, um, we're, we're immensely grateful and want to share all that. But we also don't want to have this kind of rosy glow that um, can indoctrinate and, uh, and just cover, you know, about like Kool-Aid to meditators that will then break down when they're there long enough to see things that don't really make sense. I think it's a lot better to talk about those things beforehand in an honest and respectful way. And that's, that's this, uh, avenue that Sway Win has given us by his honesty. And, you know, there's so many examples from my personal life, and I'm sure from yours as well in Myanmar, of how this breakdown of a normal functioning society affects every aspect of life. And my examples are more in terms of, you know, business and lay life, because I've I've uh, done more of that lately, at least. And I know you shared um, some very similar examples before from monastic life, uh, the same things happening, but on a monastic level, which, you know, on, on other talks, I think we're going to get into in more detail. Uh, when I was preparing for this talk, we were going to have after Sway wins. the The challenge for me was really thinking of the, the you know the the seemingly infinite examples that I could <laughs> offer here for to real tangible examples for what it's like to live in a society where so many regular functions have broken down and the kind of the personal pain of this, um, and how and, and what role Sheila plays in this. I think is is important to give some kind of evidence or some some real um, example of. So like I came up with a couple examples to share, uh, real tangible things to, to give an idea. So one is that several years ago, there was a meditator on Facebook, a Western meditator asking for the exactly official 
proper way that you stay in a monastery? And the answer was that you, you know, strictly legally speaking, as a foreigner, you cannot stay in any monastery unless you have a religious visa sponsored by that monastery. And to get a religious visa, the monastery has to go through a set of procedures and contacting local officials and writing a letter and getting that approved. And it's this long, complicated process that that may or may not work and may or may not involve corruption. And um, even if you jump through all the hoops, that still might not really mean that you're clear. And the basic advice that he was getting on Facebook from very seasoned meditators who've been here a long time was just like, hey, just go to the monastery you want to go to and talk to the Sayada, tell him your intentions. And if he feels comfortable with you and um, and he is kind of in a safe place to do it, he'll just let you stay and he'll talk to the local officials and it'll all work out. And this meditator was responding, well, no, like I am following this very ethical practice and it's the backbone of everything I do. And I want to make sure everything is official, everything is legal, everything is ethical. I, I want to be completely by the book. And it, it was just so interesting seeing this dynamic. It made total sense what he was saying. I mean, he was it, it was really, really quite wonderful to see his level of integrity. But the response he got back to that was that, you know, some there, there's not really a buy the book here <laughs> because no there's one no really book. knows what the book is. You know, there's rules out there that are um, – that are in the books and they're not enforced or they're enforced on some days or they're enforced to some extent or they're enforced in some place and not another. There's other thing, there's other so-called rules that are not in the books, but that are regularly enforced. And so there's not this like standardized code where you do this and this and this, and then, then you're by the book and then you're good. Um, you know, in my own life, that's, that's, that's an example from a meditator out there talking on Facebook. And in my own life, the level of difficulty that we've had in dealing with not really knowing how things are supposed to run, you know, make an endless confusion of where um, there might be licenses given for cars or driving licenses or businesses or homes or something like that. And then all of a sudden, one day, they'll just say, um, you know, someone, seemingly someone somewhere wants money and they'll just say every single license that we've ever issued is invalid. And you have until this period to get new licenses, of course, jumping through more hoops and paying more money. And often if you're a foreigner, those um, the, the, the protocol is not really clear and you have to hire a so-called agent where you, you know, pay more money on top of that to get these things passed. And, um, and, and so being a meditator who wants to live an ethical life the what this is all coming to and where where it's kind of the, the underlying point of why I'm telling these stories is that if you want to live very ethically know what the code is follow the cold code do the right thing um because of some of the ways that these systems aren't functioning it's very hard to do that and so this uh when sway win talked about the um some of the poor ways that sheila are being followed here and a reason for why um uh why things weren't the way that meditators might might expect them to be this thought arose this this memory arose that um when you're when you're operating in a country where the system is not really codified and functioning the way that it should be it makes it harder to live a real ethical life full of sheila because you don't really know what the right way forward is and you um, and the more you kind of stick your head up and try to ask and try to find out and try to make sure that every procedure is done the, the same way, that might actually get you into more of a mess. And so, um, and so the, the, you know, and, and, and it's been one of my learnings in Burma and also talking to him, this came about as well, that, that was really a new learning for me in my maturation, um, which I had never really thought before is that the the stability of the society and the the kind of the justice and the fairness of the society actually affects in some way the degree to which you are able to follow certain kinds of Sheila and that you can trust that you would live in a certain kind of society that would not uh, impinge on you and push you into a certain kind of area or decision making where it would be harder to know how to follow proper Sheila because um, the normal functions are not as clear and as straightforward as they can be. Um, and so hearing that part of the talk definitely referenced a lot of past experiences and thoughts that I've had in being here. That's right. And it, I mean, and you would have, if you've never lived, if someone's never lived in this kind of culture uh, here in Thailand, you know, I, I, uh, corruption is, is fairly standardized. I mean, no one really likes it, but it's, it's a, an accepted part of life that's just how it is if you need certain things you have to pay bribes especially if they have leverage on you they're going to make you pay more of a bribe 
And so, um, and it's not always the case. And, and so, but the important thing is like, where's that line, you know, and that line has to be discerned often in real time, you know, and am I acting out of greed or, or fear or, or, you know, am I really being coerced into this or am I being greedy here? You know, like, and so we, we can't, it's, it's a, what I realize it's like, a, it's a luxury to have been brought up in a just society. Absolutely. And, and with the dominant mind that the, 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 um, the proclivity of human beings is towards greed, aversion, and delusion. And so the fact that corruption exists is actually quite normal. And, and actually the kind of carving out justice and, and enforcing it is actually in some sense is more the anomaly but it's just what i grew up in so it's a kind of a shocker when i when i come out of that but as i look around the world i think i think greed tends to dominate uh and 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 so at a personal level it's like one it's just like really trying to be able to see the truth of something it might not be pretty but like this is real you know, and then making some kind of peace with that it doesn't mean condoning it. Right. But this is making peace with. Yeah, I accept that this is how it is. And then how do I negotiate that? Again, it's more of a it's not we can't be children there. We have to grow up a little bit and make some decisions on our own. And those decisions uh, take discernment that might be different in different scenarios um, and really kind of basing our sila on on wisdom that arises from our experience of gaining wisdom and applying it in the moment and applying it in different ways. That's a lot more difficult in the beginning than just relying on a set of rules, which is what we're used to. We're not forced to, to have this discernment. And so in a way that's, that's kind of a gift, right? It's more difficult. It's disappointing at first, if you've come, you know, I came from a different culture. Uh, but in the end, I think there's a, a deeper, appreciation not appreciation is the wrong word understanding of of how the world is how humans are what loba dosa moha is how it operates and how strong it is and then how we can navigate that again it might be annoying at first not to have these kind of clear guidelines but in the end we become more stronger in our application of sila if it's not coming externally um, kind of codified for us Right. And I think one of the learnings I had in living in society and also in hearing from Sway Wynn is that when you're living in a just society, the decision of kind of how moral and ethical to be is kind of your own. You're, you're generally not put in a situation where um, things are unclear and uh, you're pushed in one way or another to, uh, to not really know what the correct procedure is and to, uh, to have the sense of grayness. When you're in a just society, it's really, you, if you're if you're acting unethically, that's really an independent decision, most of the time coming from you. But um, when there is not a level of Sheila followed at higher levels in the way procedures are happening, then sometimes it's it's just very, very difficult to to find uh, the correct way of acting when you don't feel that there's a system in place that's looking out after you. And of course, in Western countries, we criticize those systems a lot and justly so, and there's a lot of holes in them, but how well they work and how repeatedly are something you don't really appreciate until you spend time in cultures where that's not the case. That being said, I, I was really curious and interested when Sway Wynn talked about the, uh, you know, he, he, he talked along these parallel tracks of, um, the practice of meditation and mindfulness and then kind of having activism towards uh, wanting to create a more just um, and, uh, and better society. And in some of the, the areas that connected both of these, you know, talking about Sheila and right speech and metta and some of these things and how these, these Buddhist practices or meditative practices would also affect society at large and have definitely made me think of what we might need in America right now. We're both American and with the current divisions we're having, how those um, those different uh, good practices of Sheila, right speech and metta would, would be helping us as well. Right, I think what, inside of that one, one really good learning is, you know, we, I think growing up in that kind of controlled 
uh, justice. And, and I'm not saying by any means that, that there's justice for everyone in America. I'm, I'm white, male, uh, so there's a ton of privilege that I have. That, I want to recognize that. But from, for the privilege class, there's, it, there's one set. And so I'm not saying America's perfect, but when you compare it to uh, coming to these places, it's really easy to be judgmental. Uh, and to have an expectation. Uh, and so what Sway Win brings to that activism isn't this blame kind of and victimization kind of thing. He said very clearly, we are all dictators, you know, and this is like what he means by that. What he says, is like it's we're only a few conditions away from being and doing horrible things. So. I think, yeah, how do I want to say this? Yeah, coming from one set of conditions, it's easy to judge another set, but but actually forgetting, it's easy to forget that if you grew up in those conditions, if you grew up in the conditions that the dictator did, in, if you had the same internal and external conditions and the same opportunities, you c could easily be a dictator. And, and it's that kind of wisdom that he's brings to his activism and i think i mean that's that's incredible to me you know he says we ha he talked about it in more simple terms about just being clean you know like if we're going to clean up society we got to clean up ourselves and you really have to understand the human condition overall and and so you know because it's so easily this division you're talking about in our culture it's just so easy to demonize the other side and i think that's where you know, we don't come back together. We're not really trying to understand. You know, I, I could go into some very, you know, a lot of details about what's going on in America. I won't right here, but uh, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think understanding that that everyone's the way everyone's behaving is based on conditions and not on being inferior or being stupid or you know, like. Um, bringing that understanding to activism, I think is essential. Otherwise you end up just being a part of polarizing and it's just going to drive people further apart from each other. Yeah, that's really beautifully put. And if you're bringing that kind of you know, anger and victimization and righteousness to your activism, then whatever cause it is you're promoting, the, the means in which you're promoting it is still putting out some degree of negativity into the world. And when Sway Win was in that prison cell, and he definitely had a lot of reason for righteousness, anger, and victimization, you know, in the situation that he was in. But he also realized that those were not uh, mental states that would help him in any way. And so he tried to find a way out of it. When you talk about, uh, when you, Zach, talk about being, um, a product of our conditions, uh, whatever whatever culture that is, we're all dictators and, and coming from certain kind of conditions, we have uh, the potential to be shaped in certain ways. This practice, this practice of liberation that all of us are following, that are going about some kind of meditative work in line with the Buddha, this is a process of removing those conditions if we're doing it right. Uh, this is a process of of looking into what, not replacing it with one set of conditions to another, but looking at how that mind is conditioned and trying to get to to an unconditioned state or at least to see things moment to moment that are unconditioned and um on the flip side of that also having an understanding or a sympathy not excusing or condoning the behavior but having some kind of understanding that people are acting according to their conditions even when we don't like it very much even when we're seeing corruption or uh, violence or um, sectarianism or something else that um that wisdom can also inform us that this is um, these aren't stupid or bad people, as you say. This is action that's coming from a place of the mind being conditioned and not get able to remove those yet. Right. I think it it takes some inner reflection, but oftentimes, well, I should say it like this: I don't always do this, and when I don't, I end up in trouble. But when I can, I reflect on. What am I seeing here in this other person that I, that aversion is arising from? I'm seeing some kind of defilement, and and it's not so it's it's not even so general that yeah, there's dosa and I also have dosa. It's like there's dosa and, or loba in this particular way. There's greed in this particular way, and even though mine doesn't manifest the same, there are similar conditions 
in my life that I can actually point to that that I have some degree of of greed in or or aversion in the same way. Um, it may not be exactly the same, but it's so it's not just this. I can relate to it in the most general terms. I can get even a little more specific, and and their shades are gray and. You know, so so Sway Wing could realize he could have been the prison guards that are taking bribes. He could have been the prison guards that are allowing or even probably uh, asking the gang to to beat this new prisoner up. Um, he could have been one of the gang members that that did that to him. It's just all a matter of conditions. And if we if we can relate to ourselves and the world that way, that this is just mind. This is and there is defilements and there are wisdom. And we if we can kind of sort that out we i think the more we we kind of coalesce as an individual i think we get ourselves into trouble the more that that loosens up and we just see there is just mind there are just bodies and there are just conditions uh, uh there can be this real compassion for all kinds of different um situations and then when we come from that place then we might be able to actually do something with activism doesn't doesn't take this kind of it has sometimes a negative connotation of being opposition or confrontation it can be actually quite an act of compassion and empathy for ourselves and the other so i i really think there's a lot of healing uh it takes that kind of wisdom in the activism to be helpful and healing right right and just as you're interpreting activism that way i also want to give a certain kind of reinterpretation or clarification of another word of rebel, you know, rebel can be, can have the connotation of being something that whatever you put in front of me, I'm just going to take the opposite side. I'm going to rebel against it. But rebel can also be a way of uh, not following the conditions that the mind is setting out for you. And I think we really see this definition of rebel in Sway Win. Um, Certainly we saw it within the story, but if we stand back and take a wider perspective and some things we didn't get a chance to get into in the uh, in the talk are covered a little bit in my introduction before it, uh, we look at what he's doing today. And he's really one of the, on the forefront of uh, Bamar, you know, the ethnic um, Burmese people in the country that are... Um, are calling out the nationalism that has taken over some of the, uh, you know, anti-Muslim and pro 969 movement. And he has really been at the forefront of criticizing that at a great expense to himself. And it reminds me, you know, it shouldn't be a surprise, I guess, because when we hear about his early, his earlier uh, observations and feelings, he talked about not, and, and even his early days as a meditator, he talked about not really understanding why he needed to show certain kind of respect or deference to seniors or to uh, people with more experience in an area or to even monks who've been in robes for a certain amount of time. He really wanted to see the, um, uh, to him, it was really the, uh, the, the value or the content of the person's ideas or actions uh, more than you know, their resume or their CV. And so with that, you know, he's, uh, he's put himself uh, by, by standing by his ideals in his role as an editor, editor he's been, uh, you know, as mentioned in the, in the introduction, he was sued and um, that was great personal expense. And he's had assassination attempts at his life, I think three weeks before we sat down for the interview, someone um, took a shot at him. And even while we were doing the interview, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of our talk, Zach, how the last time I had seen him was when he had to escape under the cover of the night after this George Packer New Yorker article came out. Well, as we were wrapping up the interview, we had gone on a little bit long in, in the interview and his uh, his wife and his daughter were asleep in the car outside. And I had it really encouraged him several times to come in and, and, and sit outside the studio and relax. And But he didn't want to wake, wake his daughter up and he couldn't contact his wife and daughter because in the studio, of course, there's no phone. So we, we don't have any contact. And as the interview went on longer, I think eventually that interview was interrupted by his daughter walking into the studio. Well, his wife and daughter were justifiably quite concerned about um, this interview with someone that they had never met going on a little bit too long. And the recent um, uh, attempts on his life and um, and uh, and such. And so um, and so our our interview was uh, we, were, we were coming to the end anyway, and it was happily interrupted by his daughter walking into the room. I think some of that was caught on audio, but it also is just kind of a testament to this guy's courage and his convictions. And, you know, we talk about a hero's journey. This guy is a true hero. He's a hero in, in the mundane sense of what he's doing. And 
Um, and he's also taken his own hero's journey on a spiritual path. I was wondering what happened at the end there. I was a little uh, unclear in the in listening to it. Uh, glad you uh, glad you cleared that up. But yeah, I can appreciate also that it's one thing to sit in comfort and then talk about and and even even act on uh, our our best intentions. How do we respond when things get tough? You know, and this is this is also a question I have during this current crisis. You know, like. How, how is our mind right now? And what's good for us in mind right now? Because things are a little tough right now for a lot of people. For are the we, current crisis, you're, you're meaning the current just coronavirus. Say, people yeah. might be listening to this at different times. You're referring to coronavirus. Yeah, right. The coronavirus pandemic. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that people, you know, this is this is uh, stress and duress of life, you know, from, from the outside, you know, and then what's happening inside? Do we have some stability of mind to offer not only ourselves and our families and our friends, but the, the wider people around us? And, and are, 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 can we, um, can, you know, just, it, there's a reflection. I shouldn't, I don't need to go into specifics, but like the, it's, a, it's a reflection back to us on, on our current state of mind, not to judge so much, but just to understand, you know. And, um, I really appreciate uh, the people that are helpful. Um, and then so even more so, uh, you know, the, the pandemic just kind of can come to us, comes to our doorstep. But like there's other people that will actually step out into it and get and the activism. That's that's a more. Um, what's the word? Proactive term, right? And then facing. Doing well in the face of adversity is one thing, but knowing that you will probably get adversity by stepping out and being proactive is a whole nother level. And and that life does call for that sometimes. Um, and so I just have a lot of admiration for that willingness to to be out on those margins and you know because a lot of the people because with wisdom though right so he would have compassion for people that that believe that way there is a a narrative in the nationalism you know that that emotionally makes sense to a lot of people obviously you know and and you have to understand that if you're going to reach these people and and show them that there's a better way if you if you negate their ideas you're also negating their feelings right off the bat and so um yeah so and we have to understand that these groups he, he's uh he's challenging their ideologies and their methods you know um they're they're not pacifists they're 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 violent uh, yeah they they use physical force and up to the point of like burning down villages or burning down buildings at least and and killing uh and and uh would we would we stand up for that? Like it's a nice reflection. I mean, and not to judge ourselves. It's not a reflection to beat ourselves up, but to like to say, like, what would I do? What would I do in that situation? Like, how how far can I go? Like w to get involved in in what's right, you know? Um, and there th there's a lot of options on what's right, but but uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, these are things we often don't have to face, and and. Uh, yeah, we need people like Sway Win. So it's nice to to meet and hear a story so personally. We do, we do, and we 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 also we need people like him in the world. And we also, I don't know if we need, but we certainly um, you could say we crave or we we benefit from the gift of their speech and opening up the way they do. I mean, what what an absolutely extraordinary, harrowing, beautiful, tragic, you know, ongoing story that that he gives us to reflect about where he's come from and where he's going and what he's standing up for now. And, um, you know, that, that as we've talked about before is combining this practice of Dhamma of looking within and taking responsibility within and, and taking those conditions off of yourself, freeing yourself, liberating yourself as you're also, uh, taking the activism outside for people that, um, that maybe can't speak or stand for themselves. And, to really want to use that activism to truly make society a better place. Um, promoting a type of activism, as you've said, Zach, that is, um, is also mindful of the emotions um, that he's putting out in the world. 
and uh, and it's just uh, it's just a privilege to be able to hear that. As Sway Wynn himself said, you know, one of the most beautiful, profound things he said on the podcast to me was talking about. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but there was a line where he talked about how you know, yeah, he would really like to have that silence of a meditation retreat. He really likes the silence. He really likes to to be able to to sit in that long period of observing himself and observing his own mind, as many of us do, probably most of the listeners on this podcast appreciate and value that. And yet, and yet, and yet, the thing, the rejoinder he said to that was, but I have to use my voice. You know, I find I have to use my voice. I can't sit forever in that silence. Of course, he does take advantage of that silence when he can. He's not eschewing it and and um, and th- you know, taking that off the table. But he's having to moderate his own silence and inner work for when he needs to stand up and use that voice and discern that it is not a time for silence in a certain venue or situation. What a contrast silence must be in his life uh something i i i can only imagine anyways yeah it was really nice to get a a a peek into that life um for perspective you know it's we have some westerners on here a lot telling their their journeys it was nice to hear uh, such a i mean what a great to hear from a burmese uh meditator what a great story Uh, uh like i said not just a story it's like a living you know this is real really inspiring. Yeah, boy, there's a lot more we can say about it. I know both of us had a few more uh, bullet points um, on each of our sides to, uh, to get through to talk about them. I mean, there's just so much filled in that, in that hour plus. Um, but I think we're, we're good now. I think hopefully we've given some listeners some, some more thoughts for reflection. And uh, I know we have some, some good ones uh, coming up after this as well. Yeah. Looking forward to it all. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay, great. We'll take care. Stay safe. Practice uh, social distancing, wash your hands, don't touch your face, and all the other uh, public service (laughs) announcements out there. Thanks, likewise. Okay, okay, take care. You have been listening to the Insight Myanmar podcast. We invite you to rate, review, and share our podcast as every little bit of feedback helps. You can also subscribe to the Insight Myanmar podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also make sure to check out our website for our complete episodes, including additional text, videos, and other information at www.insightmyanmar.org. That's one word, I-N-S-I-G-H-T-M-Y-A-N-M-A-R dot O-R-G. If you cannot find our feed on your podcast player, please let us know and we will ensure that it can be offered there in the future. There was certainly a lot to talk about in this episode, and we'd like to encourage listeners to keep the discussion going. Make a post, suggest a guest, request specific questions, and join in on discussions on our Insight Myanmar podcast Facebook group. And also welcome to join our Facebook and Instagram accounts by the same name of Insight Myanmar. If you're not on Facebook, you can also message us directly at burmadama at gmail.com. That's B-U-R-M-A-D-H-A-M-M-A at gmail.com. Or if you'd like to start up a discussion group on another platform, let us know and we can share that forum. We would also like to take this time to thank everyone who made this podcast possible, especially our two sound engineers, Martin Combs and Tharng A, along with Zach Hessler, content collaborator and part-time co-host. Ken Pransky helps with editing Kishing Bat Campbell does our social media templates, and Dragos Bandita and Andre Francois make our sketches. We'd also like to thank everyone who has assisted us bringing the guests who have made up the show thus far, as well as the guests themselves for agreeing to come and share. Finally, we are immensely grateful for the donors who made this entire thing possible. We also remind our listeners that the opinions expressed by our guests are their own and not necessarily reflective of the host or other podcast contributors. If you find the Dhamma interviews we are sharing of value and would like to support our mission, we welcome your contribution. You may give monthly donations at Patreon at www.patreon.com slash insightmyanmar or one-time donations on PayPal at www.paypal.me slash insightmyanmar. In both cases, that's Insight Myanmar, one word. If you are in Myanmar and would like to give a cash donation, please feel free to get in touch with us. (laughs) 